论坛将在十分钟之后开始。有一些贵宾还在路上，所以我们在十分钟之后开始。Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the forum. Our event will begin in ten minutes. Thank you.
我们在几分钟之后就要开始了，请各位来宾先行入座。那今天的活动将会以英文进行，我们现场备有同步口译的服务。那如果您需要使用这个服务的话呢，可以到这个报道处，凭着证件租借翻译耳机。那为了维护活动的品质，请将您的手机转为静音或是震动模式。感谢您的配合。Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Taiwan Malaysia and Halal Industry Forum. Our program will begin in a few minutes, and a simultaneous interpretation service is provided at this forum. So, if you need the if you need to use the service, uh, you're uh, please feel free to rent or collect your uh, headset at the reception desk. Thank you. And at this time, may we remind you to silence your mobile devices. Thank you very much for your cooperation. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to Taiwan Malaysia Halal Industry Forum 2023. My name is Tracy Wong. It is my great pleasure to serve as your MC today. So this forum is organized by Bureau of Foreign Trade, Taiwan External Trade Development Council (TITRA) in collaboration with the Halal Development Corporation Berhad HDC. So first of all, please welcome Mr. Simon Wong, the President and CEO of、uh, of TITRA, to give us his opening remarks. Welcome. Uh, De Mr. Lee, Deputy Director General of Bureau of Foreign Trade, and、uh, our distinguished guests from、uh, Malaysia,、um, Mr. Sahari, CEO of Halal Development Corporation, and Ms. Marina, Director of Islamic Tourism Center, and、uh, our acting president, Ms. Saya, Saya, <laughs>、uh, from、uh, Malaysian Friendly Trade Center, and all, all of our speakers, including our、um, uh, representatives from HDC, from ITC, from Tourism of、uh, Tourism Bureau of Taiwan, and、uh, CDRI, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Good afternoon. On behalf of Taiwan External Trade Development Council, I would like to welcome you all to、uh, join us in this、uh, Taiwan Malaysia Halal Industry Forum 2023. We're embarking on a remarkable journey, where the confluence of halal industry from Taiwan and Malaysia. 
forms a powerful current of collaboration. Imagine this collaboration as constellation to pioneer and create opportunities. It's like a, you know, a star in the night sky. So, you know, in Malaysia and Taiwan work together. And we are very glad that in 2021, Taitra was very pleased and thrilled to sign the MOU with HDC, Hala Development Set, uh, Corporation. And uh, after, afterwards, then, pandemic took place. So we, despite the pandemic, our two organizations still, you know, still um, organized a couple of successful webinars. And uh, today, today, it is uh, very, I would say, I'm very exciting, excited about today's event because this is the first physical event after the pandemic and first physical event after we signed the MOU. And uh, of course, there are some other uh, platforms for cooperation in addition to our engagement with HDC. With the support of Bureau of Foreign Trade, um, our other platforms such as Taiwan Expo in Malaysia, uh, which will be happened uh, in the second half of August, and Mid Taiwan Project to promote Hala cooperation. Um, in MICE Project, it's called Mid Taiwan Project, right? And there are some other platforms such as Taiwan um, Hala Food Cooking Contest or food festivals, uh, platforms like that. So full of possibilities and full of platforms. So um, I, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of you to navigate your cooperation journey um, into our further cooperation. So let's uh, embrace the spirit of openness and let's um, explore our business opportunities and let's ignite the sparkle that propels us to a win-win future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, President Wang. Thank you. Please return to your seat. So next, may I please invite Mr. Guan Zhili, Deputy Director General of Bureau of Foreign Trade to say a few words to us. Welcome. President of Taitra, Simon Wang, and all the distinguished guests uh, from Malaysia Hala Development Corporation and the Islamic uh, uh, Tourism Center, and uh, Acting President of Malaysian uh, Friendship and Trade Center, Taipei, and the uh, Trade Director of uh, MFATC, and uh, all the distinguished business friends uh, on site and online. Uh, very good afternoon, uh, Selama Banghari. <laughs> Um, I also very uh, delighted to uh, participate uh, this afternoon open ceremony for the first uh, Taiwan uh, Malaysia Hala uh, Forum after COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Taiwan Hala Promotion Center was established in 2017, and also through uh, years of uh, collaboration and efforts with uh, HDC and all the uh, Malaysian uh, stakeholders we successfully uh, built this uh, uh, platform. And also, uh, we're very delighted to have the uh, MOU to uh, put a very good uh, institutional uh, foundation framework for collaboration with Malaysia. And I personally visited HADC uh, four years ago before pandemic. And also uh, very uh, impressive about the, uh, I think the expertise and also professional knowledge and also the uh, very uh, strong power of implementation for the HALA promotion 
uh, together with other uh, HALA rela related uh, agencies and uh, institutions. Uh, right now, I think the, uh, we already noticed the uh, immense potential of the HALA industry and also the uh, greater potential of HALA market. And uh, through the uh, actions, we also like to, uh, to invite Malaysia to uh, share more about the, uh, the, uh, the insights of the uh, Malaysian market and also uh, through how can we, uh, through the collaboration, and uh, through the collaboration with uh, Malaysia and also focus on the regional and also global HALA market. I think the um, Taiwan also, uh, we quite uh, uh, determined. We would like to become the uh, center, a regional center of HALA in non-Muslim countries in the world. And also through the uh, reputation and also the ratings, uh, either in the uh, HALA business promotion uh, or the, the HALA certification and also the, the, the Muslim uh, uh, tourism uh, ratings. Taiwan also ranked, uh, uh, I think, the, uh, number one or number two in the world in the non-Muslim uh, countries. And also, uh, I think the lots of uh, uh, Malaysian people and also HALA uh, friends living in Taiwan, they also can notice and uh, be aware of the progress that the Taiwan uh, through the uh, support of the uh, our tourism uh, bureau to build the Taiwan into a very HALA and also Muslim friendly uh, destination for the uh, tourism market. So um, I just like to uh, highlight uh, through this uh, uh, forum, and I would also like to know the uh, some uh, uh, important uh, the. Uh, paradigm shift of the HALA industries. So right now, HALA uh, not only in business perspective, and also have a new perspective for economic development, and also the new meanings for the philosophical and the sociology transformation. And also, uh, HALA is a, a value of uh, integrity, of the cleanliness, of the friendship, and also is a, a way of uh, a life. And uh, so through this uh, uh, philosophical understanding about the uh, HALA industry, I think through the, uh, the more understanding about the HALA culture, uh, our business people in Taiwan can also learn more from our uh, Malaysian uh, partners and uh, friends. And also that's uh, work together and also to, through the joint effort, we can uh, jointly to uh, develop the HALA market in the world. And also uh, today, we also very uh, uh, appreciated it for all the distinguished speakers from various agencies and also the think tanks to further share your uh, knowledge about the HALA industry. And also in Taiwan, we also have a very strong base of our local manufacturers in various uh, business sectors. Uh, for example, the cosmetics, uh, food processing, and the food packaging, and also other related uh, manufacturing sectors. And not only that, I think the, we also have the uh, first tier, the tier one HALA certification agencies in Taiwan. I think they already built a very good uh, contact and uh, collaboration with uh, Malaysia. So with that, uh, I just uh, would like to see all the collaboration in the future can uh, bring more uh, fruitful and also uh, more prosperous results to our uh, economic development. Uh, once again, uh, on behalf of our Bureau of Foreign Trade, Minister of Economic Affairs, I would like to uh, thank TITRA, the, all the efforts done by the uh, HALA Promotion Center for this uh, uh, seminar, and also the uh, very strong, and I would like to have the long-standing support from Malaysia, uh, from HDC, from the Islamic Tourism Center for a very bright, uh, I think, the, uh, collaboration uh, in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Director General Lee. Thank you very much. Please return to your seat. Thank you. And next, may we please invite Ms. Sajadatu Tuli Adula, Acting President of the Malaysian Friendly and Trade Center, to say a few words to us. Welcome.
Mr. Simon Wong, um, President and CEO of Titra, the DG Lee of uh, BOFT, Mr. Hyrule Arifin Sahari, CEO of HTC Malaysia, uh, distinguished speakers from ITC, from Taiwan Bureau of Tourism, uh, Madrid, and um, honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum, good afternoon. Tatia Hao. Hao. Okay. On behalf of the uh, Malaysian Friendship and Trade Centre in Taiwan, I would like to thank uh, Taitra, um, HTC and also BOFT for organising this uh, event and also for the opportunity to address this um, hybrid forum. Um, I agree with what DDG Lee said uh, just now that for Muslim community, halal is actually practised as a way of life. So as such, um, the growing Muslim population globally has actually led to the increase in the demand of for products and services that are Sharia compliant. At the same time, there is also a raising, um, rising awareness on halal among non-Muslim, as well as the growing awareness on health and also aware, um, wellness, which are also the significant propellers of this growth. This takes into consideration that halal products and also services are reliable, safe and also hygienic. Um, so as such, while some people would see halal as a restriction uh, for Malaysia and Taiwan, we see this as an opportunity. So some, uh, some would see um, half empty cup, but for us, we see it as half full cups. And the convening of this forum, um, I believe is timely and also important as the global market is bouncing back from the adverse impact of the pandemic. For Malaysia, we attaches great importance to the halal industry. We have given halal industry a special focus um, in our industry master plan, as well as the um, establishment of few agencies that coordinate and monitor the implementation of halal initiatives. This also includes um, HDC, which, we, uh, which was established under the Ministry of um, International Trade and Industry, or MITI, in 2008. Um, in Malaysia, the halal industry is projected to expand and contribute to 8.1% to Malaysia's growth domestic product by year 2025. We have recently launched our halal industry master plan 2030, or HIMP. I think that HTC will um, explain further about, about this. And we hope that um, all business in Taiwan and Malaysia could um, reap this opportunity to, um, to explore future collaboration in terms of halal industry. Um, as for Malaysia, we aim to remain as the main source of reference for halal integrity know-how, global leader in the innovation, production, and also a trade of a number of halal-related products. And it has been uh, for Malaysia, it has been one of the main sources of references, including for Taiwan, um, in various areas within halal industry development and also governance. So we want to be um, the, um, the hub for people to look into and also for people to refer to in uh, finding the opportunity, also the definition of halal as a whole. So today we are very much honoured to have representatives from HDC and also from ITC and Taiwan um, Tourism Bureau to share with us some insightful information on the halal ecosystem in Malaysia as well as in Taiwan and the potential of halal and Muslim friendly businesses. As halal has been featured as the key priority for Taiwan also um, under the new South Bank policy, so we see this as um, another opportunity for businesses from both Malaysia and Taiwan to better seize the opportunity and capitalize on each other's strength and mutual advancement. So the distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, each year since 2004, Malaysia has been hosting the world's largest international halal showcase, or we call it MIHAS, and with the aim to provide an avenue for businesses to thrive in the halal trade, enhance networking opportunities, and significantly contribute to the global halal ecosystem. So therefore, uh, please allow me, through TITA and BOFT, um, we would like to invite all interested companies from Taiwan and also from Malaysia to participate in the upcoming 19th Malaysian halal Interna uh, International Halal Showcase, or MIHAS, 
which will be held from 12 to 15 September 2023 in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, we see that Mihas as a great platform to better tap potential opportunities in the halal market globally, especially in this um, Asia-Pacific region. So on this note, I assure that Malaysia will continue its commitment to share its experience and expertise with Taiwan and also with other countries to create a friendly environment for halal industry. So um, to everyone, I would like to uh, wish you a very pro fruitful and also productive discussion in this forum. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sajala. Do please remain on stage as we're going to take group photo. Please, can you please uh, come over here? And uh, today we're very honoured to have the presence uh, Ms. Sajala too, this way, please. <laughs> so here, that's, thank you. We're very honoured to have the presence of many distinguished guests. May I please invite the following guests of honour onto the stage for group photos. And uh, please come to the stage when your name is called. First of all, please welcome Mr. Simon Wong, the President and CEO of Titra. And also Mr. Guan Zhi Li, Deputy Director General of the Bureau of Foreign Trade. And also Mr. Haroy Adifin Sahadi, CEO of the Halal Development Corp Corporation, Berhad. Welcome. Yes, please. Thank you, Mr. Haidoy. Okay, now please look at the cameras in front of you. And you're in Taiwan. We have to have a photo with thumb up. Okay, thumb up. Together, we wish every success of the uh, Taiwan-Malaysian Halal Industry Forum. This, this is a very exciting forum. The first one, the physical one after the pandemic. So happy to see, see everyone here. Thank you. And please remain on stage as we're going to invite more guests onto the stage. And now, may I please invite Mr. Ben Huang, Director of the Tourism Bureau of Taiwan onto the stage. And also Ms. Aninawati Saleh, Director of Malaysian Friendship and Trade Center, Taipei. And Ms. Marin, uh, Marina Mohammed, Director of Industry Development Division, Islamic Tourism Center, ITC. And uh, Mr. Brian Lee, Executive Director of Taiwan External Trade Development Council, Taitra. And Ms. Rachel Liu, Deputy Executive Director of Taiwan External Trade Development Council, Taitra, and Mr. Moh Talif, Gauss Moh Anwa, Senior Manager of the Halal Development Corporation, Berhad, and Mr. Tony Lee, Senior Marketing Planner of Commerce Development Research Institute. So can we please come closer to the center and maybe standing in the curve and slightly on your side, okay? Right, now please look at the cameras in front of you. We have a lot of cameras here. Okay, together we wish every success of today's forum. First of all, please look at the gentleman who just raised his hand. And also other cameras, which uh, we have a lot of cameras here. And also please give us a thumb up. Together we, with Malaysian Taiwan uh, partnership and friendship, Together, we can develop this market with huge business opportunities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Hyroy, please remain on stage. And the, for the rest of our uh, guests of honor, please return to your seat. Thank you. Please. Ladies and gentlemen, now we're going to proceed session one. The forum today is divided into three sessions, and each session will focus on one major topic. And we have invited speakers uh, both from Malaysia and Taiwan in each session. And I believe that you already received your question sheet at the reception desk. So you're, uh, please feel free to write down your questions on the question sheet and hand it to our staff. We we'll either uh, answer your question on site or later on get back to you after the forum. So now, without further ado, please welcome our first speaker, Ms. Hyroy, CEO of HDC, who will shed light on halal industry ecosystem. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam MC, for the lovely introduction, uh, guests of honor, fellow speakers, organizing committee, uh, distinguished guests, uh, this, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon. To all of you. Yeah. 
Yeah, and assalamualaikum for those uh, Muslim. So uh, usually I will take around one hour and one and a half to deliver this lecture, but I will try my best to complete everything within uh, 30 minutes so that we can we can have uh, additional additional time for question and answer later on if there is. Uh, my topic of presentation we call uh, Hala Industry Ecosystem and overview and insights from a 50 years of ex excellence in Malaysia experience in developing our halal industry for the past uh, 50 years. My name is Hairul Arifin Sahari. You can call me by the name of Hairul. I'm the CEO of Halal Development Corporation Berhad. So allow me to, you know, walk around the stage, you know, because you know, it's a bit, I'm here. So, okay, uh, for the next maybe 30 minutes, so what I'm going to cover uh, these five topics. We will start with the introduction on halal, toyib, and the industry, and the supply chain itself. Secondly, on Malaysia halal ecosystem and achievements. Thirdly, is on the issues and Malaysia's strategic responses. And a little bit about the master plan, if I have time, and then about HDC and also our intervention. This is me. So over 20 years spending uh, worth of experience to be shared to you guys within 30 minutes time. Bear with me. Right. Let's go to basic, so about halal and toy. Yeah, what is halal and what is toy? It come together, right? Halal means uh, permissible according to the Sharia law or Islamic law. Of course, you know a little bit about uh, non-alcoholic or no pork. Later, the esteemed speakers will explain to you more further about this topic. And of course, uh, all the sources and ingredients must come from permitted uh, resource sources. Yeah. And secondly, it's on toyib. It comes together with halal. Toyib means good to consume or apply. Right? When, when I mean toyib, good to consume or apply, it means healthy, nutritious, clean and safe, and of the high quality. So that is uh, knowledge number one about halal. So it's quite pretty, pretty much basic for you to understand about halal and also toyib. And okay. So let's go deep into the industry. When we talk about halal industry, so there's a norm being used for all these years, halal and industry. But if we want to take it a little bit technical, a little bit deeper, halal is actually not an industry. It is a value proposition of the existing industry. So here you can read, halal is a value proposition that exists within key elements of the supply chain of the intersecting industry sectors. So what are the industries we're talking about? So we're talking about the processed food and beverages, meat and meat-based products, cosmetics and personal care, warehousing and handlings, drugs and supplements, and also ingredients, including for non-food and also food items. Right. Let, let's deep dive a bit, a bit further on the halal supply chain. So this is the basic uh, food and beverages supply chain that we know. So it involves what we call from farm to fork, all the way starting from the input, agricultural inputs, to production, to processing and distribution, marketing, and all the way to the consumers themselves. Right? So these are the activities involved in, in each segment. Yeah? But if you notice, those I mark in uh, orange here, those are the critical components which require halastification. So if you look at here, those I mark in, 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 in orange. So let's go through one by one. Yeah? So in uh, agricultural input activities such as animal breeding, crops propagating, animal feed, fertilizers, hormones and medicaments, herbicides and pesticides, all this does not require halal certificate. Okay? And let's go to the production side of it, the production of poultry and ruminants, Vegetables and tubers, cereals and other commodities, all these activities also does not require halal certificate. That is based on Malaysia standards yeah? and also Malaysia practice. Okay, now we go into a critical control points in halal supply chain, which is the processing and also distribution. The slaughterhouse, the processing plants, the OEMs, the OBMs, etc. These require halal certificate. Industrial zones? No need halal certificate. And central kitchens, collection and distribution centers, cold chains, testing laboratories, this can be certified halal. And online and online uh, trading platforms does not require halal certificate. So you must understand what are the critical control points within your supply chain that require 
halal certificate. And during the marketing, of course, you have the online and offline marketing and distribution. The hypermarkets and shops can be certified halal. And of course, you know, restaurants and eateries can also be certified halal. Food trucks in Malaysia, I don't think so. We, we have a halal certificate or halal standards on food trucks. So there you go. So you understand, you must understand your supply chain, what kind of product you produce, and you understand the supply chain and what are the critical halal control points that you are facing. And those critical control points must be certified halal if you decide to jump or to move into this halal market space. So this is uh, about the size of uh, halal market. By 20, uh, it was in 2020, 2020 based on HDC's own uh, analysis in 2020, uh, the size of the halal market was about USD 3 trillion and we expect it to grow to 5 trillion by 2030. So this calculation is based on a demand uh, offered by the Muslim consumers. But if we include the demand by the non-Muslim consumers which are, who are also looking for certified halal goods, actually this number of 5 trillion, we are actually looking at 30 trillion size of global halal market offered by the Muslim consumers as well as the non-Muslim consumers. Yeah? But it is very, very interesting to look at the numbers here. The big chunk of the halal market is actually here, Asia Pacific. And not many countries in Asia Pacific are Muslim majority countries. So that is very, very interesting. So it's showing that, showing that it's not just the Muslim that stay within that country are looking for the halal goods or halal certified goods. There are also Muslim who are traveling to that particular country also looking for the halal goods, like myself. You know, yesterday when I arrived, like 6 p.m. In the, in, the, in, the, in the evening. So the first thing I, I asked my team, where do we get halal food? And my, my team told me that, yeah, we have like 300 meters away from the hotel, Hayat, Hayat uh, Hotel. So we have one Indian cuisine restaurant. So let's go. So that is typical Muslim traveler like me. Right. So you see, uh, and if you look at later, I will show to you uh, our halal export, Malaysia halal export, 70% of our halal export, about four trillion, uh, about seven trillion, uh, seven billion of them, uh, end up in this particular region. You know? So that shows that consumers within this particular region are also looking for uh, halal goods. But bear in mind, yeah. Also, we never deny the um, uh, the, the opportunity offered by other uh, continent such as Europe and Eurasia. Eurasia MENA, Middle East, Middle East and Northern, Northern Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa. So these are other uh, major um, source of uh, or, or, uh, market for the halal products in Malaysia. So by, by looking at the increase, the, 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 the level of increase uh, among all this uh, region, you see the Sub-Saharan or Africa is about 0 0.4 trillion at the moment, but the increment 100% for the past uh, three years. So that is very, very huge opportunity for halal traders and also halal investors out there. Now in Malaysia, um, yes, it mentioned earlier, so Malaysia halal industry is to reach USD uh, 113 billion by 2030. It was announced uh, when the Deputy Prime Minister announced the uh, halal industry master plan 2030 uh, during the first day of Ramadan this year after he uh, chaired the Malaysia Halal Industry Development Council. Uh, he said that halal industry in Malaysia is going to contribute about 10.8% to the country's GDP uh, by 2030. So this is what I'm talking about, the potential of the halal industry. Just now I mentioned that the size of uh, halal market uh, in 2020 was 3 trillion USD. But in terms of the supply going into the halal market is nothing more than 20%. So if you look down there, here, there are a few players, big players in halal, including Malaysia, Australia, New Zealand, Thailand, Brazil, UAE, Singapore, and Netherlands. But if you look closely, the type of products that they are producing and exporting to the whole world, see, like Malaysia, we are very strong in FMB and palm-based ingredients. Australia, very strong in dairy, meat, and meat-based products. New Zealand, they are big in dairy and goat meat. Thailand, FMB, but if you look further 
the types of product that they produce and they export, they're focusing more on fruits and marine or aquaculture-based products. And Brazil, they are big in poultry and, and also meat. And surprisingly, and also interestingly, UAE, Singapore, and also Netherlands, they are not producer of certified halal goods, but they use halal as a value proposition to enhance their uh, trading activities. They position their country as the collection and also distribution of halal products. Right. So these are the industries that we are talking about. Uh, just now I mentioned, this is a repetition, uh, processed food, meat and meat-based products, cosmetic and personal care, drugs and supplements, ingredients, warehousing and also handling. So if you look at the gap here, we are talking about 80% supply and demand gap. So when I was in Australia uh, last year organizing our World Halal Business Conference in Melbourne, so during the press conference, a journalist asked me, so what is Malaysia strategic response to address or to manage this 80% supply and demand gap. So my answer was, if I'm left with only 10 to 15% supply and demand gap, so my answer, Malaysia will compete and Malaysia will compete fiercely. But now we are talking about 80% supply and demand gap. So the strategic response will be Malaysia will collaborate and Malaysia will cooperate in various countries out there, including Taiwan in order for us to uh, have a more seamless product movement, halal product movement between Malaysia and other parts of the world so that our brothers and sisters out there can have better access uh, to certified halal goods. So, okay, this, this is a little bit technical, but I still want to share with you. So these are the two core pillars uh, building the Malaysia halal ecosystem uh, since 1974. So in 1974, the government of Malaysia through JAKIM um, issued what we call the Halal Certification Letter, basically to certify or to, to confirm that one product is, certified, is, is confirmed halal. So basically to uh, protect Muslim consumers during that time. So what we have developed since 1974 to year 2000 is what we call this pillar number one. It's Halal Governance Development, pretty much managed by JAKIM. So it covers areas like compliance to Islamic law, Islamic science and research, Sharia experts and talent development, halal standards and certification. This is the one side of halal ecosystem which we call the governance development. But in year 2000, the government realized that, hey, Malaysia now has a very good halal certification framework. So what's next? So but where are the products and services? Because we must understand, Consumers out there, they don't buy halal logo or halal certificate. They buy products and services. The halal certificate or halal logo must be stamped on your products or your services, right? So starting from year 2000, the government of Malaysia started to embed this halal agenda into various strategic documents, such as industry master plan, and then we come up with our Halal Industry Master Plan 1.0, and then the Malaysia Plan 9, 10, 11, and currently 12. So it has been Halal agenda has been always top on the list when it comes to Malaysia's Halal socio-economic agenda. So we came up with another pillar, which we call Halal Industry Development. This is where activities such as Productions and manufacturing, food and including food and non-food uh, production and manufacturing, services and industry enablers, infrastructure uh, development, including the industrial areas, incentives, etc., uh, industrial standards and certification, industrial experts and talent development. So, when we combine these two pillars, then we successfully created what we call Halal Malaysia Halal Ecosystem, and at the moment we have over 200 industry players whether they are certified halal and potentially halal, and supporting them are 300 organi 360 organizations from the government and various institutions, both at federal and also at a state's level. So why so many organizations involved in halal ecosystem development in Malaysia? Because the nature of halal itself is so diverse. It cut across various uh, sectors, food and also non-food, and therefore it cut across various ministries and also agencies. Last time we count, 360. So that's the reason why the government of Malaysia gave HDC a huge mandate to become the central coordinator for all uh, activities or programs related to halal development 
in Malaysia and also connecting Malaysia's halal ecosystem to the rest of the world. Yeah. You know this logo? This is a Halal Malaysia logo, but what, is, what does it represent? It represents this. Yeah? All these elements within the ecosystem. Right? In the middle, smack in the middle, Halal socioeconomic, this is the core agenda. It's all about using Halal or Halal uh, knowledge to enhance Malaysia's socioeconomic development. So that is core. Right? And we have the key result area, this grey uh, round. Uh, first is on the investment, trade, employment, and also halal integrity. So whatever we do, you know, end of the day, it's all about these four items. How halal can increase or bring more investment into our country, and how halal can boost our trade, how halal industry can increase employment opportunity, provide employment opportunity for our people. And of course, top on the list, we must, we must ensure that halal integrity is always uphold throughout the supply chain. And these are the key enablers, talking about uh, awareness and promotion, data and analytics, conformity assessment, incentives, infrastructure and logistics, science, technology and innovation, human capital, and last but not least, policy legislation. So these are the key enablers that move and also work the four key research area. And the blue round here, these are the ecosystem community and also the beneficiaries, I would call it. So who are the players? They are the multinational corporations, the, uh, the local large corporations, micro and also the small and medium enterprises and also consumers at large. So in summary, the halal ecosystem is a network of components involved in growth cycle and delivery of halal products and services, contributing to the overall socio-economic development. And each component in the ecosystem has its own unique activities that are interrelated with each other, creating a constant evolving relationship towards sustainability. So that is how Malaysia been evolved, you know, from just issuing our first halal certification letter, now to become the powerhouse of the halal industry of the whole world. This is a basic, uh, when, when pe people love to, when, when they see, when they come to HDC, people love to ask me this question, which halal is better? Malaysia halal, Indonesia halal better? Or is it Thailand halal is better? Okay, this is how we differentiate ourselves between uh, Malaysia and also other parts of the world or other uh, partners as we, as we describe it. So, uh, halal Malaysia is the most recognized halal certificate or logo worldwide. Right? Simply because, uh, we have mutual recognition with 84 certification bodies from 47 countries. And based on acceptance, over 150 countries worldwide known to have halal, local halal certification, certification bodies, our penetration rate is about 31%. And as far as uh, the exporters and investors are concerned, we are very attractive in terms of trade and also investment because the investors and also traders are looking for better access to a bigger market space, access to a wider range of options of halal ingredients and semi-finished goods, and they want more products in the, and also halal ingredients in the supply chain. So meaning that, meaning that more products in halal ingredients in the supply chain, the strongest the supply chain that they will possess. So imagine that halal is like a passport so, of course, you want to own a passport whereby you can enter more countries. Right? If halal is something like currency, so you, of course, you want to trade or when you want to use a currency where it is accepted in most of countries in the world. So, that is the difference that we have in the moment compared to country B, which I don't want to uh, tell you which country. Right? You can figure it out yourself later. Yes, uh, from a greater perspective, there are seven components of Islamic economy. This is just an additional information for you guys. Uh, the promoter sectors is still halal, okay, food and non-food products. And we are also uh, starting to promote the Muslim-friendly services uh, for uh, activities which are not covered under the Malaysian halal standard, including uh, tourism, uh, medical, retail, and etc. Later, I made to understand that there will be a session on Muslim-friendly, which is going to be covered by my colleagues and also my partners. And these are the enablers 
that really can move the, the promoter sectors, including the Islamic financing and banking, uh, wakaf or endowment, takaful insurance, zakat donation, and also arhanu Islamic mortgage. So these are the areas which we are promoting at the moment. So we want to have uh, the best, what we call the value chain when it comes to halal, supported by the enablers available by financial institutions and other institutions involved in the economic activities. So in terms of investment, uh, Alhamdulillah, uh, investors prefer Malaysia as it offers a gateway uh, to enter targeted halal market. So I asked the investors why they love to come to Malaysia. There's a two, there's a two reasons. Number one, they may want to make Malaysia as a gateway to enter certain halal markets such, such as uh, Southeast Asia. You know, Southeast Asia halal market at the moment almost a trillion USD uh, in terms of the market offering. And the second reason why they love to come to Malaysia and invest and set up their halal operation, they love to make Malaysia, their operation in Malaysia uh, as the center of excellence for their global operation. I give you an example like Nestle. They are like 130 years in Malaysia already. In Nestle have over 1,500 factories all over the world and more than 500 are certified halal in almost uh, 40 countries, not mistaken. But the certified halal factories all over the world are always referring to Malaysia's operation when it comes to halal. So same goes to FNN, same goes to Hershey's, same goes to Kellogg. So that's the reason why all these industry players, all these investors love to come to Malaysia and set up the operation on top of the special incentives given by Malaysian government if they set up the operation within our halal industrial parks. So in Malaysia, we have uh, 14 locations altogether uh, designated as halal industrial parks. So we have successfully uh, attracted over 16 billion worth of investment since 2010. So in terms of the size, 190k acres, cumulative land size for, for uh, any business out there who wish to set up the operations in Malaysia. We have over 50,000 acres left uh, for any investors out there who wish to come to Malaysia and set up their halal factories. And uh, it is a home for more than 300 tenants, including 45 multinationals and 270 SMEs. So these are the halal industrial parks in Malaysia, and these are the key investors currently operating in Malaysia and make Malaysia as their hub to enter uh, specific halal markets such as Southeast Asia, MENA, and also Asia Pacific. So this is our halal export. Last year, Alhamdulillah, God, uh, thanks to God, uh, the halal export has increased. Uh, to 63% from uh, just 36.3, sorry, 36.3 here in 2021, increased jump, uh, it's, a, it's a big jump to 59 billion, almost 60 billion in 2022. So these are the five, top five halal export destination, uh, China, Singapore, Indonesia, United States, America, and the uh, and Japan. So these are the industry that we, they are, these are the products that we are exporting at the moment. You see more than 80% are here among the processed foods, ingredients, including the food and non-food. And we see a good growth uh, in cosmetics and personal care and also pharmaceuticals industry. So it shows that uh, the Malaysia halal industry now moving into a more high value item. So it's not, we are not saying that uh, food and beverages is no longer the key, key uh, sectors, but the industry now looking into the non-food sector, which offer a better price in terms of, and better uh, potential in terms of uh, market acceptance and also market size all over the world. So this, uh, yeah, talking about the issues and challenges, even though we are already 50 years in business, but our SMEs also still facing, we are still facing some uh, issues uh, among our SMEs when it comes to getting halal or getting, getting their operations certified halal. So this is still happening in, in Malaysia. So it's, for us, uh, it's between the misperceptions uh, and realities among the industry players, uh, in particular the SMEs. So the misperception number one, the SMEs out there still think that getting halal is difficult and costly in terms of uh, money and time. But for us, in reality, actually the SMEs out there still lack of preparations yeah? and also access to capital and right expertise. So, we need to work around the system. The act is there, the, the, the law is there, the act is there, the enactment is there. So is there, the bureaucracy has its own reason. 
So we have to work together how to beat the process and how to work around it yeah, to get your, your, your operation certified halal as soon as possible. So work with various agencies, including HTC, to increase your knowledge, to increase your um, readiness before you submit your application to your agencies like in Malaysia, uh, Jakim. And misperception number two is the SMEs can't see how halal can add value to their existing operations. So this is pre and post. Before an SME apply or get the halal certificate, they already exporting. They might be already exporting to two countries, right? But when they go through the halal certification process, the expectation is very high. So they hope that with halal logo stamp on their products, they are, they are expecting that their product can be exported to 20 countries overnight. So that is the expectation. But after two years, they're still exporting to two countries. There's something wrong. You know? So they, this is where we need to intervene. The government agency like ADC will intervene through the capacity, increasing the capacity, increasing the capability, and also access to market. So after an SME, after you got your HALA certificate, you must not just sit down. You, know? you must continuously do marketing, marketing, promoting, and continuously promoting your products. Work with your government agencies like Titra in order for you to enter a bigger market offered by uh, the global consumers. Yeah? And misperception number three, of course, blame everything to the government. This is very, very famous. Lack of support from the government and they do not know who to get, who to contact and where to get help. But in reality, SMEs in Malaysia, including in Malaysia, are confused with uh, rules of various agencies involved in halal matters. So that's the reason why just now I mentioned, earlier I mentioned the government of Malaysia appointed HDC as the central coordinator uh, when it comes to all matters regarding halal ecosystem development uh, in the country. Well, uh, yes, uh, for me or for HDC, getting halal uh, or getting a halal certificate actually is not difficult. So it is rather inclusive uh, than exclusive. So. I think you know various international standards available out there. GMP, Good Manufacturing Practices, Halal and Hazard Analysis in Critical Control Points, or HESAP, FDA, and other uh, standards. I believe that the Taiwanese government also have their own, have its own uh, food standard here. So, which is a very good start. You don't have to start from scratch in getting halal. Get yourself familiar with your local standard first. Then, what you need to do in getting halal so you just need to do three things. Number one is to hire or train a full-time halal skilled personnel. So this is a very, very important uh, person in your halal operation, which will help you to develop halal certification operational framework. So this is very, very important. So where do you can get them? You can get, it, get them either uh, from your uh, halal certification agency or you can also get them from organization like HTC, whereby we train thousands of halal executives and, and halal internal auditors on a yearly basis. And secondly, is to get certified halal ingredients. Well, this is very important. The ingredients in halal, halal ingredients in halal operation is very, very important. Right? For you to produce a certified halal and goods, all ingredients to be introduced into your production line must also be certified halal by your authority or by your certification agency or certification agencies recognized by your country. Uh, so in Malaysia just now, I mentioned to you, JAKIM recognized 84 certification bodies from, eight, from 46 countries. So as far as Malaysia supply chain is concerned, we have trade networks with 46 countries. So this is very, very important. And thirdly, just tweak a bit your premises, storage, and also layout. So you don't have to start from scratch. Yeah, just upgrade a bit, add two or three items, and then you can get your halal certificate. Okay, let's go a bit deeper. Okay, uh, please pay attention on this slide. So, I when it comes to when people ask me, okay, what does or what is halal certificate halal certification process flow process flow looks like? I usually I don't like to share process flow because it is very very confusing. Right? So we just need to understand the three major phases throughout your journey of being halal and more. The first phase is what we call 
the pre-approval phase. Second phase is the approval phase, and the third phase is a post-approval phase. So what do you need to do during the first phase, which is the pre-approval phase? So you need to complete your training, and you need to hire your advisors or consultants if you need to. And then you need to complete your pre-audit on premises. And you must have access to competent halal executives and halal internal auditors. You must also have access to certified halal ingredients and supporting services, access to capital and incentives because later you need to upgrade your, your production facility to meet the standards. And you must have proper halal market intelligence. Some of your product might need some lab testing and verification if necessary. And you must, have, you must work with the agencies around you uh, to follow up on the non-conforming application. So these are the checklists that you need to have before you submit your actual application to your local authority or your certification agency. Yeah? And during the approval process, so this is what you will experience. Number one, you, the authority will complete the halal audit and later they will provide you with approval. Either it is an outright approval or it is a conditional approval. Or sometimes you will get rejected. But don't worry, if you get rejected, you come back to an organization like SDC, whereby uh, we, we, we can assist you uh, to rectify all the issues and help you to resubmit your application back to the authority so that you can obtain uh, fast as, approval as possible. And process must not stop here. So now, once you got your approval, so now you are entering a post-approval stage. This is things that you need to do because you need to be prepared for renewal process even though the renewal process will only come like two years down the road. So when people ask me, when the SMEs ask me, when do I need to prepare for my renewal process? So my answer is your renewal process must start a day after you get your approval because the integrity of halal must be uphold throughout the supply chain. You cannot be like one day you are halal, tomorrow you are not halal, so you cannot. So you must ensure that your halal processes is always uphold, you know? Uh, throughout your, the approval period. So, this is you, these are the things that you need to uh, experience later uh, when you got yourself uh, certified halal. Uh, the preparation for the uh, halal certificate renewal, including periodical audit, refresher courses for your halal executives and internal auditors, and also you will be enforced by the authorities. In Malaysia, we have JAKIM and other uh, agencies involved in enforcement of halal. Branding and promotions, and you, of course, you want access to a new and larger market space, uh, export and also domestic, and access to additional capital incentive. Let's say you go for diversification and also for expanding of your, your factory and other interventions uh, which you can tailor made uh, according to your needs, uh, can work together with the local authority and local agencies like uh, HDC in Malaysia, point of view. So, these are the three big phases that you need to remember. Uh, throughout which you can experience and throughout your journey of being halal and more. So details, uh, later you can talk to my team here right, on how, what, what will be the process looks like. Because if I want to share with you the entire process, it's going to be very long and tedious and very confusing. So you just need to understand these three major phases. So this is what HDC does. Okay, HDC is not a certification body. Okay. Jakim in Malaysia, Jakim is the certification agency. Yeah? What HDC does is we manage the industry development part of it. Right? This is what we do. Just focus on these four items. So whenever a company, an SMEs, come to HDC, whether they are already certified halal or they are looking for halal or, or, or entering the halal space, so this is what we offer to them. Number one is access to funding, financing and incentives. Secondly, is access to market space and marketplace. And thirdly, so enhancing marketing and capabilities. And number four is promoting talent and thought leadership. So these are the four uh, objectives that we will uh, offer to our SMEs who, are, uh, who came to who come to SDC to seek for guidance and also assistance in order for them to enjoy you know, their journey uh, of being halal. So these are the activities, that, these are the core programs and services. Again, uh, we would love to position ourselves as your trusted partner in halal businesses. Uh, we have Halal Training Institute where we provide upskilling, 
uh, reskilling and job placement of human capital. We have halal consultancy and advisory. This is about business transformation, uh, helping companies out there to get halal certificate and growing their business worldwide. Our halal parks is where we provide investment promotional activities, uh, facilitation and development of the industrial park itself. And we have a couple of uh, capacity and capability, capability uh, building program, uh, business and market intelligence, uh, talent development, branding promotions, and also event management. This is things that we do in HDC on a daily basis. And of course, one and a half year ago, we organized or we uh, launch our Halal Integrated Platform. This is a business online networking uh, facilitation, also market development. HIP is basically HDC in virtual format. So whatever you can see, whatever you can touch, or whatever you can experience in HDC, also available in virtual format through Halal Integrated Platform. This is our avatar in the virtual world. Right. So talking about uh, a little bit later, my colleague uh, Dalif and Madam Marina will touch a bit on, to touch more on this Muslim-friendly services. So you talk about uh, expanding the halal product market space through this MFS or Muslim-friendly services guidelines. So for HDC, Muslim-friendly services uh, is a new uh, way of us in creating new market space for our halal products. So Various services out there can be certified or can be classified as Muslim friendly, including the hypermart or mall, convenience shops, health and beauty centers, hotels and accommodations. So imagine that we have health and beauty centers out there which are certified as Muslim friendly. So we can encourage those centers to use certified halal cosmetics products and also personal care products. So in a way, we are creating a new market space for our products and also services. So as a conclusion, uh, a way forward, so we know that now we have 1.8 billion Muslim population with only 20% of the demand are met and hence, opportunity is enormous. So what must we do? Number one is we need to connect the halal ecosystems and the supply chain. We need to complement each other and establish mutual recognition on halal certification and processes. The idea is always on increasing halal export, investment, and quality employment opportunity. To do that, we must nurture more homegrown champions among the local SMEs, the very, very competitive at global arena, and we must implement holistic interventions for our SMEs to reach halal and other premium standards, and we need to recognize, enhance, and exchange talent. So this is a call for action by HDC to our partners like Titra, you know, for us to uh, have a more fruitful collaboration and also cooperation in future. And with that, I end my presentation. Thank you. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Thank you. A big round of applause for Mr. Hai Roy for your informative and insightful talk. Thank you. So the opportunities of the halal market is huge and it is not that difficult to get the certificate. And uh, Mr. Hyroy just gave us some examples, even explaining the process flow, um, pre-certificate uh, um, and being a, a pre-approval, approval and post-approval stage. So that really gives us a good idea how we can start and HDC is there for, to, to help. Thank you very much once again. Thank you for your um, excellent talk. Thank you. Okay, now our next speaker is Ms. Rachel Liu, Deputy Executive Director of Taiwan External Trade Development Council, Petra. And the topic of her talk is Halal Industry Opportunities in Taiwan. Now, please welcome Ms. Liu. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rachel. I'm the Deputy Executive Director of our Strategy Marketing Department from Taichu. Um, Taichu is the Taiwan's fo uh, foremost trade, non-profit trade promotion organization. Uh, we are sponsored by the government and industrial associations. Taichu assists enterprises to expand their global markets. We are headquartered in Taipei. Um, 
We have a team of uh, 1,300 uh, specialists. Um, we operate five uh, local branch offices and uh, over 60 branch offices. Um, together with uh, Taipei World Trade Center, which is TWTC, and the uh, Taiwan Trade Center, TTC, uh, we have uh, formed a network to uh, uh, expand in and uh, to, to form a global network and dedicated to promoting the world trade. Um, so today, I will briefly introduce the current status uh, of the HALA industry in Taiwan. Um, I will briefly uh, cover in the current status uh, and I will introduce the Taiwan HALA Center, and also I will discuss a little bit about the opportunity what we have with uh, between Taiwan and Malaysia. But uh, before before I get into this uh, HALA topic, I want to emphasize and uh, to 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 let people know why HALA is important for Taiwan. Um, do you know that uh, there is only fifty thousand? Muslim population in Taiwan, which accounts only for 0.2 percent of our entire population. So why Hala here? So in my opinion, um, I like to say that because Taiwan is very limited in resources and that we don't have enough, big enough uh, domestic markets. That's why Taiwan relies on international trade. That's why Taiwan has always been proud to be a strong economic uh, um, performance. For example, last year, we are the 21st um, largest economy in the world. And uh, we are, and we are 16th six, largest exporter from the world, especially for Southeast Asia country because South Asia, Southeast Asia is Taiwan's second largest export market. And uh, we have, Taiwan has uh, actively uh, engaged in trade relationship with uh, South Asia countries such as Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, and the Philippines. And these countries um, represent a significant export market as well as uh, important sources for our import uh, as well. So, and also because uh, Taiwan is proud to be recognized worldwide to be a nation of uh, freedom and safety as well as uh, friendliness. That's why we are open to multiple culture in the world. So since uh, Islamic culture and the religion have a significant influence on Southeast Asia countries, shaping the region's uh, political, social, and the economy landscape, that's why Taiwan has to embrace HALA and develop uh, its uh, HALA industry. So now here I will introduce a little bit about the current status of HALA industry. Um, like I mentioned, there's only 50,000 uh, local population of uh, Muslim. Um, but uh, plus that, we have 250,000 foreign German Muslim live in Taiwan. Uh, many are uh, new immigrants and uh, foreign German workers. And uh, currently, for the uh, development of uh, Islam Islamic economy, there are three parts uh, involved. The first is about the Muslim friendly environment, which is charged by to the same Bureau of MOTC and uh, our local government. And then the second part is about the uh, HALA industry development, which is uh, mainly in charge by Minister, Ministry of uh, Economy Affairs. Um, uh, under that, uh, I think uh, our Taiwan Trade Center, and we have our CDRI who is in charge of the, research, the market research and reports, 
as well. And the third part is about the HALA certifications. Um, for this, um, uh, for this uh, tourism bureau and uh, for this CDRI, we will have a fuller discussion in that section. So I will introduce a little bit about the rest of them. So if we look at this diagram, uh, you can see um, there's uh, totally there's uh, 12, uh, 12 uh, HALA certificates bodies. Um, two of them, two of them are certificate agents only. So it means that we have these 10 uh, certificating uh, bodies here in Taiwan. Uh, I'd like to emphasize that unfortunately, so far, there does not uh, have any yet uh, any official agencies uh, for HALA accreditations or any governmental authorities issue um, uh, HALA certificates yet. So we have only non-governmental uh, certification bodies and they each issue their certification of their own. Um, among which, uh, here probably we all know that uh, CEDA is the biggest and the many, and they have uh, recognized by um, Joaquin from Malaysia already. And if we look at uh, this uh, certificate, um, thanks to the support of uh, Taiwan's uh, certification bodies, um, there's uh, currently there's uh, uh, 1,061 uh, companies that obtained the uh, certification already, uh, among which you can see um, are about 70% uh, of them are for goods, um, including raw material and process products. And uh, we have uh, hotels, instruments, and uh, tourist sites as well. Uh, this, this number is still not much to be, to be said. Uh, we are still at a very early stage. But uh, if we compare this number to what we have in 2017, uh, because this is the year when we set up the Taiwan HALA Center. So it has already been a 35% growth. So we are happy uh, to, to, to see there's uh, some outputs of our efforts, although we still have a long way to go. And here are some of the examples um, which have a HALA products, and all these products can be seen in the Malaysia market already. So probably some of you have seen this product in the supermarkets already. For example, we have a Royal Family, which is very famous for its Muaji. And we have Hei Song, uh, which uh, sparkling water, uh, sparkling drinks is uh, pretty popular. We have this uh, 315, which is uh, whose uh, milk, instant milk tea is very uh, popular as well. Um, besides that, uh, because we know the bubble tea uh, is very popular, is uh, very well known uh, in the whole world, so probably uh, in Malaysia, you have already some uh, tea shop like uh, Cha Tan, Gong Cha, as well as uh, Tiger Sugar already. All these products or tea shop can be, already can be seen in the Malaysian market. So this is just a few short brands that I want to mention here. And uh, the next uh, for the um, Taiwan Hala Center. Um, in pursuit of the development of uh, the global Muslim markets and uh, the construction of a uh, Muslim uh, friendly environments, the Bureau of Foreign Trade of uh, Ministry of uh, Economic Affairs uh, entrusted Taicha to set up this uh, Taiwan Hala Center uh, in April 2017. As we know, this Hala is more of a lifestyle. It, it is for Muslims to live uh, their daily life uh, with the halal principles from their behavior, from their um, habits, activities, to their interest. So thus, we like to set up the core value of Taiwan Hala Center as 
people-centered. That is what we do. We do everything about people. And here is the formal, the formations uh, that's for the Taiwan Hala Center, among which I like to mention only, I think the most two important parts. First is to promote uh, Taiwan's Hala products because uh, we want to let the global market to, to learn more about what Taiwan can offer. So this is, uh, we, we, we try, I, I will discuss, we, I will introduce uh, more detail follow on, on how we approach, achieve this mission. And uh, the second biggest uh, task we have, I think, is to encourage and assist Taiwanese SMEs to apply for HALA certification. This is very important. It might be not easy, but this is very, really very important for us. Uh, together with this, we will promote a Muslim friendly environment and we, 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 sent, we position ourselves as an information integration to, to, to better uh, promote the, the overall HALA industry in Taiwan. So how do we achieve uh, the missions I just mentioned? So for the first part, we, organ we participate in international trade shows because uh, international trade show is the most important platform for us to, to showcase our Taiwanese HALA products. So uh, we bring Taiwanese companies to, to exhibit at like uh, Gulf Food, Mihas, and uh, for the uh, Taiwan Expo. The, which show is organized by Taicha. We have uh, Taiwan Expo in Malaysia and Indonesia, so the Taiwan Hala Center will join these activities. And uh, some we, for the trade missions, we, we organize and see what opportunity we have. So this is, uh, this is, like, uh, uh, this is all related to specific uh, topics. And uh, for the, most, the, the more common parts, what we have is to held uh, foreign workshop and seminars. Um, so currently, um, we have uh, the Taiwan Hala Center has organized more than 60 uh, seminars uh, with more than 4,000 participants already. Um, for example, um, last time we have this uh, Six Nation Hala Industry Forum here in Taiwan. And we invite uh, speakers from Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, Thailand, Philippines, and Turkey to, to come to Taiwan and to share the regulation and the principle of the HALA certification in their country. As people know, because uh, there is, so far there is no universal HALA certificate, so each country has their own However, uh, these events uh, turned out to be a big success because uh, it helps Taiwanese people, to, Taiwanese company to know, to know more, to learn more about all these uh, certification from these countries. But also in this uh, occasion, in this platform, all these uh, speakers from six countries, they found it interesting to, to, com to network and to communicate and uh, to to compare the difference and the similarities of their certifications in each country. So this is uh, one, big, one big event we used to hold. And uh, besides all the last two parts, um, sometimes we have this uh, so-called uh, soft events, um, or, like, or event marketing. For these events, the purpose is to build, to establish a closer communication with uh, Muslim consumers, and we want to enhance their positive uh, perception of uh, Taiwan's HALA industry and the products. So, for example, here, uh, every year we will have this uh, Taiwan HALA products promotion events in Martin supermarket in Malaysia. We have this every year. And uh, last, since last year, we have this uh, Taiwanese Hala food cooking contest in Malaysia as well. Uh, later on, I will introduce this a little bit. 
And though last year we also have this uh, Mar Day's Fashion and the Beauty Online pop-up show. Uh, all this uh, turns out to be very uh, interesting activities. Um, like because of the deep, uh, limits of budget, uh, everyone has this kind of question, right? There's always not enough money. So we have to try very hard to, 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 to come out to create some inno innovative uh, activities. And this, this uh, Hala Food contest show turned out to be a big success. Uh, during this event, uh, we invite, uh, uh, we collaborate with a local Malaysia chef and uh, the students from their cooking school, and uh, we ask them to use Taiwan's food material to, to cook and to contest. Um, so here I will have this uh, video for you to, to have a sense of what we have done. There. From now. All right, but I'm going to go to the next one. So I believe that one day this Taiwan halal product become one of the uh, the most uh, important elements uh, to combine with the local menu, local ingredients to come up with one uh, wonderful, successful, and the very innovative menu in our for our local uh, product, our local food especially. actually didn't spend a lot of money, but we have 55 news exposure for this single event. And there was a lot of high interest uh, of discussion among the consumers. So we will continue this activity this year. So just for your information, and please join on site. Um, OK. And um, also, the last part for the Taiwan Hala Center is because I said we, in, we serve ourselves as the integration of uh, information. Uh, so the digital uh, marketing tools is very important to us. That's why we operate websites, Facebook and Instagram to, to spread and to, to publish uh, our news and the, the in, in achievements we have in Taiwan. So for the opportunities, what we have, I think uh, Hala, Hala says better than I do because you just mentioned a lot of opportunity we're going to have between Taiwan and Malaysia. And I'd like to emphasize that because uh, the industry is pretty diverse and now we know that getting Hala is not that difficult. So I think uh, the most important thing is uh, just go for it for the HALA, so the opportunity will be huge. And here I'd like to just mention two points. Um, the first is uh, because uh, if we look at the table from CETA, because uh, they are the main uh, certification organization in Taiwan, if we look at this uh, charts, we can see food material and additive is all and about here food. Uh, healthy food. This is the biggest part of the Hala products we have. And uh, here, I think this is a good thing because for this food material, Taiwan has very long uh, history in, in Taiwan has a uh, very diverse, uh, excuse me,
because uh, Taiwan already has a mature, mature the processing technology for food, for co cosmetic and biotechnologies. Um, according to the table we have, we can see that 33% uh, of Taiwan's halal good consists of uh, food materials. Um, this, is, this together with uh, Taiwan's uh, capacity of R&D, and uh, if we combine with the, if we combine with the manufacturing technology and the positive reputation of uh, Muslim markets uh, from the Malaysia side, I think we can form a really good collaboration um, supply chain partnership. So in this case, I think for the um, um, for the material is the one is the main category that we we will uh, flow on to to, to to seek into any operation for both country to collaborate in the future. And the second one I like to mention is uh, plant based meat, because um, um, the trend for veggie meat has been on a significant rise due to the. Um, Due to more and more people, they are aware of the environmental impact of uh, animal agriculture and the ethical concerns surrounding meat consumption. So, veggie meat becomes a quite cheap uh, trend nowadays um, because of Taiwan's um, because the religious uh, backgrounds of Taiwan's history. Taiwan has been in the plant based meat industry for over 30 years already. So, together now, combined with the technology we have uh, and the uh, innovative uh, innovation we, capability we have, I think we will have a lot of chance to, to develop uh, this. Sorry. Sorry. So I believe that uh, this could be a very interesting, a very potential for both of us to work on. Um, there are there are already many premium corporations that in the uh, meatboard industry in Taiwan already, and some of them have HALA certificate already. Here I met two example. Um, for example, this uh, San Sanji Sanji Plan Best. They have HALA certificate already, and the other is uh, for no meeting. No meeting is the brand name of uh, of these products, and these these two products they all have a uh, certificate already. And uh, um, in during uh, this year's uh, trade show, like I say, we we attend the golf show. We we bring this product to, to to showcase them, and they are very popular as well. So later on that this year, we will bring this product to Malaysia as well. And uh, to to the most important of all, I think two is not enough. So that's why I need to work hard to encourage more uh, meatball uh, product to obtain their HALA certifications. Okay, so this will be my presentation today, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Liu, for your excellent presentation. Thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, whether you're uh, joining us on site or online, if you have any questions, please feel free either to write down your questions uh, on the question sheet and hand it up to our staff, or leave your question online, and uh, we will get back to you afterwards. Thank you very much. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we'll proceed to the second session of the forum today, Muslim-Friendly Tourism in Malaysia and Taiwan. So now, please welcome our first speaker of this session, Mr. Ben Huang, Director of the International Affairs Division of the Tourism Bureau of Taiwan. And the topic of his talk is Muslim-Friendly Tourism in Taiwan. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ben Huang from Taiwan Tourism Bureau. Um, it's my pleasure to be here to uh, talk about uh, to talk about uh, Muslim friendly tourism in Taiwan. 
Uh, there are three sections in my presentation. Um, I will present an overview of Taiwan inbound tourism, uh, Muslim-friendly resources, and uh, initiatives catering to the Muslim-friendly market. And before I talk about Muslim-friendly tourism in Taiwan, uh, I would like to share with the, uh, the, the friends from Malaysia uh, some general information about Taiwan and the inbound tourism in Taiwan. Okay, uh, here uh, we have a map about Taiwan. We know that uh, Taipei is the capital city of Taiwan, and there are two climate zones, uh, subtropical and tropical. And most important of all, Taiwan is visa-free entry for 30 days for Malaysia. And this page shows that the inbound visitor statistics for Taiwan before pandemic. Uh, the, before the pandemic, inbound visitor numbers uh, reached uh, 11.8 million. And uh, the average uh, length of stay for all inbound visitors is about uh, six nights. And the average daily expenditure per visitor is uh, about 200 US dollars. And the uh, total annual amount of tourist visitor expenditure uh, is 14,400 million, US million. And uh, overall inbound visitor satisfaction is 98 percent. This is a ranking of uh, inbound visitor sightseeing spots. Nine markets, uh, Taipei 101 and Simending Jiufen Canton National Park, Chiang Kai-shek Memorial Hall, Sanmen Lake, uh, Yeliu, Danshui, and Longshan Temple. And this is a uh, uh, visitor favorite scenic spots. Top three is Canton National Park, Sanmen Lake, and Jiufen. And this is a ranking of, of activities for inbound visitors, shopping, night market visits, historical relic sightseeing, exhibition, lake tour, Ica tour, and hot spring soaking, and hiking, massage, and visit uh, tourism factories. Uh, Taiwan has a variety of uh, theme activities every month throughout the year for international tourists to experience. So Taiwan is a very good destination for international tourists. And transportation is very important for tourism. So uh, Taiwan has a convenient uh, transportation system uh, and facilities. It takes only 90 minutes uh, to travel from Taipei to Kaohsiung by high-speed rail. And Taiwan also has a rail system around the island. And in, in addition, uh, there are MRT systems in Taipei, Taichung, and Kaohsiung. So Taiwan is a well-suited destination for independent travelers. Next, I'm going to uh, introduce Muslim-friendly resources. Uh, Taiwan Tourism Bureau have, has set up a Taiwan Muslim Friendly Environment page on the website of the, uh, uh, the web page. The web page is taiwan.net.tw. And Muslim friends can find certified restaurants, hotels, sightseeing spots, and places to worship. And uh, on this page, is the answer just uh, Marina <laughs> just asked me. Um, we uh, for example, there are 144 certified Muslim-friendly accommodations, about 200 certified uh, restaurants uh, in Taiwan, and uh, 100 and 12 Muslim-friendly environments, such as shopping centers, leisure farms, and tourism factories. Uh, when Muslim tourists come to Taiwan, they can find prayer rooms in the train stations, high-speed rail stations, and the shopping centers, 
a comprehensive list can be found in Taiwan Tourism Bureau's website, uh, which I just said, taiwan.net.tw. Okay, um, in Taiwan, uh, mosques are mainly located in metropolitan cities like Taipei, Taichung, and uh, Tainan, Kaohsiung, and Taoyuan. As you can see, the certified hotels we are providing the, uh, the uh, Qibla direction, prayer mat, watchlet, and timetable for solat. Also, uh, they have to remove uh, any improper decorations, alcoholic drinks, and uh, they have to remove uh, inappropriate channels. As a requirement to get a Muslim-friendly certification, uh, the, uh, the restaurant must have two separate kitchens in which one of them is a special kitchen for uh, where hala food is prepared. And it also has to provide uh, tableware and cutlery that is handled uh, separately from those being used for non-Muslim guests. Also, they are advised to hire Muslim chef to prepare halal foods. Uh, like most tourists, uh, many Muslims also love shopping. Uh, uh, outlets in Taiwan are very popular among the Muslims. And regarding the souvenirs, the Taiwan Tourism Bureau continues to cooperate with the tourism factories and uh, assisting uh, the industry in developing HALA certified souvenirs. And there are Muslim friendly facilities and uh, uh, many transportation hubs and uh, scenic areas. For example, traveler uh, will find uh, Muslim prayer rooms uh, available at Taiwan's international airport, uh, a railway station, and uh, our uh, 13 national scenic, scenic areas and national highway service areas. Taiwan continues to promote and encourage travel agencies to provide Muslim-friendly travel packages. And uh, there are a total uh, 22 Taiwan travel agencies which have received the HALA certification. Okay, um, this year, uh, Taiwan uh, ranked third place uh, among non-OIC uh, uh, countries in the MasterCard Crescent Trading Global Muslim Travel, Travel Index. And since, actually since 2019, Taiwan has been ranked in the top Three. Um, this uh, achievement reflects that uh, Taiwan's government's success in creating Muslim-friendly tourism resources and its overall uh, performance has been recognized internationally. Okay, um, the se this section, uh, I will uh, introduce some uh, initiatives catering to the Muslim-friendly market. Uh, in order to create awareness of Taiwan as a Muslim-friendly uh, travel destination, our Kuala Lumpur branch office has put lots of uh, initiatives at the Muslim-friendly market. Uh, I'm going to share uh, what we have done in Malaysia market to attract Muslim tourists. Okay, these two charts uh, shows visitor arrival before the pandemic. And now uh, we can see that uh, the Southeast Asia can, uh, market is very important uh, to, the, to Taiwan to the industry. And Malaysia visitors make up uh, about 21% of Southeast visitor numbers uh, no, uh, before uh, the pandemic and now about, about 21%. Uh, of the Southeast uh, uh, visitor number, uh, Malaysia visitors uh, ma uh, make up the 21% of Southeast, can uh, Southeast country visitor numbers. Okay, our 
Uh, we set up the, the Salam Taiwan website uh, in our uh, Kuala Lumpur branch office, uh, in, uh, by our uh, Kuala Lumpur branch office. And we also conduct Taiwan's Muslim friendly tourism environment improvement project. And uh, uh, we organize Muslim B2B workshop, Taiwan fan tree agent, agent visit. And uh, we keep updates on the latest travel information on our uh, social media. And uh, we participate in the Mata Fair and set up the Salam Taiwan booth to create awareness of Taiwan as a, a Muslim friendly travel destination. And we provide a Malay brochure and uh, we cooperate with a famous brand and we use the cinema, uh, cinema advertisement, and we cooperate uh, with OTA, uh, like uh, KK Day, uh, and we uh, promote a, a tourist campaign with the OTA. And we use the Muslim KOL to promote Taiwan as the, the, the tourist destination, and we use the vehicle branding advertisement. And this year, we used that uh, celebrity to be our uh, tourist ambassador, uh, Lisa Aida. Uh, she is very famous in Malaysia. Now, we are, I will show you some uh, videos of uh, Taiwan promotion videos. Di tempat ini, ada kemeriahan, ada juga yang mendamaikan. Kelasatan, unik, semuanya mampu menyerikan dairi kehidupan. Berbeza budaya, namun tetap harmoni. Di sini, dairi kehidupan indah bermudas. Okay, we have another video. Taiwan. Taiwan. And Taiwan has a romantic get, uh, getaways, lots of activities suitable for couples and hala romantic dining. We see the next <laughs> we see the next uh, video. Stepping out of the shadow in my room Caught between cowboy clouds and mist Salam Taiwan And the last one is for trading, right? We have another, the, the, the last uh, video Taiwan. Okay, um, Taiwan is a Muslim friendly destination and Taiwan is ready and we sincerely welcome all of you to this Taiwan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Huang. Thank you. Please remain on stage as we collected two questions for you. And the one is that how many Muslim tourists have visited Taiwan? Um, Do you have the number in hand? Actually, uh, as we 
we did not specifically inquire about the uh, religious beliefs uh, tourists visiting Taiwan. Uh, we do not uh, have an exact figure. However, based on uh, the number of uh, uh, travelers from uh, the countries such as um, Malaysia and Indonesia and the Middle East, uh, it is uh, estimated that uh, about 200,000 Muslim visitors have come to Taiwan uh, from January to May this year. Right. Okay. Uh, yes. As a, as a Taipei citizen, I do feel yes. that the number of Muslim right, uh, right. Uh, tourists uh -huh. actually increased. Mm. And another question for you is <laughs> yes. that uh, this is a question um, from, uh, he said that uh, I'm in the hotel industry in Taiwan and I don't know much about the Muslim culture, but I think Muslims are a great potential market. How would you advise me to start? Uh, okay. I. I think uh, there are several uh, HALA certific uh, certification units in Taiwan, and you can get, a, I think you can, uh, it, she or he can get uh, oh, yep. uh, a lot of uh, information uh, just by, you know, Googling uh, HALA certification. And Taitra has uh, established a Taiwan HALA center. I think uh, this will help uh, uh, this audience. Thank you. Okay, thank you. A big hand to Mr. Huang. Thank you for your excellent presentation and uh, some really romantic videos as well. <laughs> uh, very attractive, isn't it? Okay, so now may I please invite the second speaker of the session, uh, Ms. Marina Mohammed, uh, Director of Industry Development Division, Islamic Tourism Center, ITC, who will uh, give us a talk on Malaysian Muslim-friendly tourism and hospitality. Please welcome Ms. Maria. Mari Marina, my mistake, Marina. Guests of honor, uh, distinguished speakers, and also uh, participants. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. A very good evening to all. Uh, my name is Marina. Yeah, I'm from Islamic Tourism Center uh, in from Malaysia. So just today, just to present to you what what does it mean or why uh, are we. Um, how do we say uh, Islamic tourism and also Muslim friendly hospitality and tourism in Malaysia? All right. Um, let me just go to the first one. Okay. Okay. So before we go to um, what is Muslim friendly or what is um, uh, Islamic tourism, let's just go and revisit first. You know the percentage of the Muslim population, yeah, that we have all around the world, the demographic of the Muslim all around the world. As you can see, the total Muslim population. Yeah, the whole world is about 2 billion, which encompasses uh, about 25% yeah, of the world population and expected to actually grow to 2.3 billion yeah, by 2030. So it is a huge market, yeah, especially when we talk about uh, Muslim-friendly tourism, when we talk about Islamic tourism. Yeah, the same goes to the halal industry. Yeah. And from this yeah, um, demographic, um, I would say, infographic that we have here, then we can see that uh, um, the percentage or the ratio of the female and males yeah, is about 50-50. We have about 49.2% yeah, of females and 50% of uh, male yeah, for the Muslim population. But the most interesting that I want to share with you here is the median age yeah, of the Muslim population where we have 70% yeah, of the Muslim are actually under the 40s. Yeah? And from this 70%, yeah, which is about 1.46 billion, 21.5% yeah, is actually under the generation of alpha, 27.2% is under the generation of Gen Z, and another 22.9% is actually the millennials. 
Okay, so alpha would be someone who is born from 2010 to 2025, and Gen Z would be from 1997 to 2012, whereas millennials would be from 1981 to 1996. Yeah, uh, the Gen X, yeah, which I think I would fall under Gen X, yeah, 1965 to 1980, and based from this, yeah, we can see that the the majority of the uh, Muslim yeah, that would travel around the world would definitely come from this age group. 70% yeah? of the Muslim population or 70% yeah, of the Muslim travel travelers and tourists that come to Taiwan will come from this category. And how do we capture those, um, um, I would say, demands. How do we capture those travelers and those uh, tourists yeah, with all the initiatives, yeah, uh, with all the programs that you have yeah, to capture this? Yeah. So this is a very interesting data that we have here. And um, from here also, we can see that in most of the 48 countries, the population of the Muslim is more than 50%. So I heard this now um, that most of the travelers that come to Taiwan are actually from Malaysia as well as Indonesia, which, which is actually falls under this category. And in most of 28 countries, Muslim population are between 10 to 50 percent. And they live in more than 200 countries around the world. Yeah. And from this Muslim population, yeah, about 32.3 percent are actually from the G20 countries. Yeah, 31 percent from the SRC, Arab League will continue contribute about the 21%, uh, ASEAN 14%, and the smallest would be from EU, which is about 1%. Okay. So these are actually the market that we are looking at. Yeah, these are actually the programs and the initiatives that we should target to yeah, in order to capture the Muslim yeah, market around the world. All right. Okay, and this data is actually recently produced uh, by MasterCard Crescent Rating yeah, for 20, uh, 2023. Next, okay. So this is actually the performance yeah, uh, that I would like to share with you on the GMTI performance matrix in 2030, uh, 2023, where you can see here Taiwan yeah, and also Malaysia. And the, the size of the circle actually indicates the total volume of Muslim arrivals yeah, to the country. Okay, so there are four quadrants altogether. Yeah? So this quadrant, they actually called it a trailblazer. So this is where... Uh, most of the Muslim travelers yeah, would go and visit yeah, other countries, followed by the potential leaders, which is this section here. Yeah? And Taiwan is actually falls under the emerging destination, yeah? which um, this category or these countries around here will definitely can go up to here. Yeah? And Taiwan, even though the number of uh, volume of the Muslim arrival is small, but basically, um, when they get the third place under the GMTI, yeah, for this year, um, the top destination for the non-OIC countries simply means that they do have, you know, I would say Taiwan do have a very good infrastructure yeah, in terms of capturing the Muslim markets. Yeah? As, you, as mentioned by Mr. Ben, just now you have more than 144 uh, hotels that have been recognized halal. You have uh, more than 200 restaurants that are actually certified halal, as well as I just realized yesterday you do have what they call a certified Muslim entertainment. Yeah, in in uh, Taiwan. Congratulations. Yeah, uh, I've been to uh, I went to Taipei 101 yesterday. Yeah, and I actually went and see there's the signage of Muslim praying area. Yeah, went and look at it, and it was actually clean. Yeah, uh, you do have your Qibla direction in there. You do have your prayer mat in there, your sajada, and and it's it's well kept, and it is not hidden, you know, uh, somewhere, which I think is a good indicator to show your strong support, yeah, for the Muslim travelers yeah, coming to Taiwan. All right, okay. So when we talk about Islamic tourism, what does it mean by Islamic tourism? Yeah. So Islamic tourism I actually define as any activity. Yeah, event or any experience undertaken in the state of travel that is in accordance to Islam. Okay, so anything yeah um, that is done yeah by the Muslim travelers yeah in accordance to Islam 
any activity that they participate in, uh, the place that they stay yeah, during uh, the travel yeah, will be under what we call the Islamic tourism. And Islamic tourism is actually huge. Yeah? Um, some countries may call it halal tourism. Yeah? Um, some countries may call it sharia-based tourism yeah? or spiritual-based tourism. Yeah? So this would fall under a bigger umbrella, which is a Muslim uh, Islamic tourism. But for the Malaysia, yeah, we are rebranding uh, or we are, we are um, uh, taking a part of the Islamic tourism yeah, where we, we brand it as Muslim-friendly tourism and hospitality. Yeah, we don't actually uh, uh, promote, yeah, as in um, uh, ITC, yeah, we do promote Muslim-friendly tourism and hospitality, but not the Islamic tourism and, as a whole. Yeah? Because, um, like I mentioned, different, different uh, uh, category that falls under the Islamic tourism, like Sharia-based tourism will be catered more to the spiritual-based tourism, more to the Mecca when they do their pilgrimage and so on. But Malaysia, our focus will be more on the Muslim-friendly tourism and hospitality because it is more open, not just friendly to the Muslim, but also friendly to the non-Muslim. Yeah? The concept that we are promoting here, the concept that we are encouraging here under the Muslim-friendly tourism and hospitality are basically security and also safety. Yeah? For the Malaysia, Alhamdulillah, this year, um, for the eighth year, uh, we have been uh, the top destination for the Muslim travellers under the OIC country. Yeah? And also, this is our second year, Malaysia has been um, um, awarded by the top destination for Muslimah travellers. Muslimah meaning that female travellers because of the safety and also the security reasons yeah, that we have been promoted through this MFTH. Yeah. So it is actually a niche tourism segment yeah, suitable for both Muslim and non-Muslim. Yeah. It's also a value add to the Muslim tourist to a destination. Yeah. Every services, every facilities that we have, we must make sure that it's all Muslim friendly. Similar to what Taiwan has, you do have your Muslim-friendly environment. In Malaysia, you know, we also have Muslim-friendly shopping malls. We have Muslim-friendly amusement park. We do have Muslim-friendly tourism products. Yeah? We also now uh, have Muslim-friendly uh, um, medical facilities, yeah? as well as Muslim-friendly uh, spa and wellness centres. Yeah? Okay, so this definitely will provide assurance yeah, to the Muslim-friendly services and also facilities that are provided. Yeah. For those who get this Muslim-friendly uh, tourism and hospitality, definitely it's a marketing tool yeah, for the tourism to attract um, the tourists to come um, to, to the destination. And we brand it because Malaysia, yeah, we brand it as a moderate Muslim country because we do have multiple races, we do have multi multiple cultures. Yeah, and this is what we are also promoting. Yeah, uh, for all the tourists to come to Malaysia to actually enjoy and actually experience. Yeah, um, how we, a multiracial company, live together in, in harmony. Yeah, uh, as well as yeah, um, appreciating each other cultures. Another tourism uh, concept that we are promoting in Malaysia is what we call a mosque tourism. Okay, so when we see, uh, when you see a mosque, yeah. Um, we look, it is actually a sacred place you know, for the Muslim to perform the prayer. Yeah? But that doesn't stop the non-Muslim to actually come and experience and come and see what is it that we are doing in the mosque. Yeah? It is a sacred place. Some of the areas, certain areas, yes, you cannot enter. But the rest of the area, you know, we are telling the whole world is that you know, Islam is not something that is close-minded. Yeah? Islam is something that can be shared with all. And one of it is through our Muslim tourism. In Malaysia itself, we have more than um, 200 mosques that have been identif identified as uh, mosque tours. Yeah? And um, this uh, mosque tourism, they have um, a lot of activities going on, yeah? not just to the Muslim, but also to the non-Muslims. Yeah? Um, one of the um, famous uh, mosques yeah, that we have in, in Malaysia is the Sendayan, Sri Sendayan Mosque, yeah, which is a big white uh, uh, mosque, which resembles one of the mosques in, in Turkey. We also have the mosque in Putrajaya itself, yeah, that is also considered as a mosque tourism. Yeah. So the progress of the tourism uh, in Muslim countries is that to show the interest yeah, uh, of the promotion of the mosque as the mosque tourist attraction, 
demonstrate Muslim places of worship, like I mentioned. And also, this creates interest yeah, among the visitors from various backgrounds yeah, and various uh, religion belief in visiting mosques and encourage them yeah, to offer tours to, uh, to Muslim places of worship. Okay, so these are some of the trends yeah, based on the research that ITC has done. These are some of the Muslim travel trends that would attract yeah, the tourists to come to the destination. And in Malaysia itself, we have about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven trends yeah, that we're looking at. The first one is we discover yeah, new experience and knowledge. Yeah. Um, second is compliance to the Islamic principles and values, yeah, demands for the hygiene and also cleanliness. Improve health, wellness, mind, body, and soul. Use digital. Yeah, now it's a digital world. You know, so people when people want to come to Malaysia, for example, or when people want to come to Taiwan, for example, they actually refer to the digital information that you have. You know, whether do you have a place uh, for the Muslim to perform their prayer? Do you have halal food? And you know, these are the two main things. Yeah, that we should take into consideration. Yeah, if we want to attract the Muslim travelers or tourists to come into our country. Yeah, the first one everybody got to eat, so we need to find halal food. Yeah, no matter where we go, the Muslim need to eat, just like you guys. So halal food is important. Yeah, the second one is that we as a Muslim we need to perform our prayer five times a day. Therefore, we need a place to actually perform our prayer. Yeah, and those places not necessarily has to be a mosque. Yeah, it can be a small uh, a room. Yeah, dedicated only for prayer. Yeah. So those are the two important things that, that any countries yeah, that would like to attract the Muslim to come to their countries, yeah, you have to think about the food, yeah, you have to think about the place where they can do their prayer. And you know, respect, and we, this is also one of the trends, yeah, when they go travel, they are actually looking for any sustainable and responsible practices. And of course, yeah, when we go for traveling, yeah, the things that we would like to see is actually to appreciate nature, history, arts and culture and heritage of that particular country. So let me just go into detail yeah, when we talk about Muslim travel trends and how we can actually adopt it and put the component of the Islamic tourism as well as MFTH yeah, for all these trends. The first one, yeah, what we do in Malaysia is that yeah, when they come to Malaysia to discover new experience and knowledge, we are also promoting the celebration of Ramadan. Ramadan is a, is a time where the Muslim need to fast yeah, before the Eid. Yeah, so we, we, we have to do our fasting uh, at least yeah, uh, 29 to 30 days every year. Yeah? So for the, Mal for the Muslims yeah, from all over the world that would like to experience Ramadan, yeah, they can actually experience Ramadan in Malaysia, where here we have, we have a very, uh, I would say, um, happening and also a very um, interesting yeah, celebration, especially during the iftar, during the break fasting. Yeah? And when we actually celebrate at, at the end of the Ramadan, we celebrate at with multiracial communities in Malaysia. We have Malays, we have Chinese, we have Indians. These would be the three big um, races in Malaysia. But you know, when it comes to Muslims, they come from more than, all, more than three races. Yeah? They can be a Malay Muslim, yeah? they can be a Chinese Muslim, yeah? they can be an Indian Muslim. Yeah? So the way we celebrate it is actually depending on the races. So this is where we, would, we, we promote yeah, how we celebrate it. Yeah, based on different different cultures, yeah, not compromising on our beliefs, yeah, and also uh, learn and appreciate Islam through the mosque and also tours and also homestay experience. So in Malaysia, we have a product what we call a homestay, where the Muslims, especially the Malays, open up their house, yeah, for the travelers to come and experience staying, yeah, um, um, with with the Malaysians, yeah, experiencing the Malay culture the Indian culture, the, the Chinese culture, but in the context of the Muslim friendly. Okay. And of course, all this must make sure that it is in compliance with the Islamic principles and values. Yeah? Uh, like I mentioned, availability of the places to pray, yeah? um, where they can eat freely. Yeah? Um, a lot of uh, uh, foreigners, when they come to Malaysia, the first uh, restaurant that they will attack is McDonald's. Yeah, because they know that they cannot eat McDonald's yeah, freely in, in their countries. Yeah, but in Malaysia, every restaurant, McDonald's restaurants in Malaysia is halal. Yeah? 
every fast food restaurant, you call it McDonald's, um, KFC, um, um, Texas Chicken, um, all these are halal. Yeah? So they can eat freely and also availability of halal products. Yeah? The products that they can actually buy in Malaysia and bring home and enjoy it at home. Yeah? So these are the things that um, we have in Malaysia, Alhamdulillah, uh, considering yeah, Malaysia is a Muslim country. But yeah, for the non-Muslim country, having a halal product yeah, to actually get the halal product from Malaysia into Taiwan is also one of the ways yeah, to actually ensure that when the tourists come to Taiwan, they got halal products, they got uh, halal food to eat. Yeah? Okay. And in Islam, yeah, we actually regard hygiene and cleanliness highly. Yeah? In order for us to perform our prayer, yeah, our five times uh, daily prayer, we need to make sure that we are both spirit spiritually and also physically clean. Yeah? Spiritually, meaning that we're actually doing our obligation. Yeah? Um, we also need to make sure that physically we are clean. Yeah? Like just now, Mr. Ben Huang was showing yeah, the WC with the hand bidet. Yeah? When we go to the washroom, we need to have a hand bidet. We need to make sure that physically we are clean. Yeah? Physically, that we are free from dirt, we are free from filth in order for us to perform our prayer. Yeah? So cleanliness and hygiene is very important. Yeah. So, like I mentioned, the toiletries also has to be uh, 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 clean. Yeah. And the area must be free of nudge, meaning that free of dirt. Yeah. To perform the prayers. Yeah. Right. Okay. Next would be yeah uh, under the component of uh, the trends. Yeah. Um, everybody, I think, would like to go uh, out uh, when they go travel. Yeah. Um, they would like to to go to the place where they can heal. Yeah, uh, where they can experience calmness and so on. So here, yeah, to improve health and wellness for the mind, body, and soul, yeah, we do have what we said: Muslim-friendly spa and wellness facilities. Yeah, where we provide safety, we provide privacy, and also feeling secure, especially for the women. Yeah, when they start rejuvenating, yeah, and pampering themselves. Yeah, um, in Malaysia, uh, we make sure that yeah, for those. Um, Muslim friendly spa and also wellness centers, yeah. Uh, the therapies are actually gender sensitive. Yeah. So if let's say I were to go to a spa getting a treatment, then my therapist has to be a female. Yeah. So for a male, the therapist has to be a male. Yeah. So this is to make sure that yeah, we feel secure. And of course, for the Muslim, yeah, for the female, uh, we can only be seen, yeah, uh, by the female, yeah, and not by by the male because um, um because um, we can only be the male that can 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 be with us, yeah. When we open our hijab, actually our family and also our husband, yeah. So we need to make sure that the services that we are providing are actually gender sensitive. Number one, yeah. And also we also need to make sure that the product that you're using, yeah, um, the personal care that you're using, the lotions that you're using, um, um, the essential oils that you're using, those are also has to be halal certified or at least plant-based products, yeah? Because um, some of the products may contain uh, alcohol, yeah? And some of the alcohol may derive from the production of alcoholic beverages, yeah? Uh, so any products that are actually using the ingredients, yeah, uh, derivatives from the alcoholic beverages are definitely considered as a non-halal to the Muslim, yeah? And also we do have a separate and dedicated time for the woman in the recreational activities. The usage of swimming pool, the usage of gymnasium, yeah? instead of having two gymnasium for the female and male, yeah? some of the hotels uh, would actually offer yeah? different, different times for the female yeah? so that they can actually perform or do their, their activities yeah? uh, safely. They don't you know, feel uh, insecure yeah? having you know, other people or especially men looking at them. Yeah, so some hotels they do offer at different different times. Yeah, for the female, um, for swimming pools, like I mentioned, for gymnasium, um, for spas, and also other activities. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, digital as travel news and sources, Islamic destination and packages, marketing and promotions. Uh, for ITC itself, uh, we how we help the industry, especially the travel agent. 
yeah, to promote their Muslim-friendly packages is actually uh, we are working uh, together with Amish Holidays, yeah, where under the Amish Holidays, they actually have a Muslim-friendly packages yeah, um, so that any um, Muslim tw uh, tourists that would like to actually enjoy the Muslim-friendly packages yeah, can actually uh, request yeah, uh, for uh, packages that are suited yeah, uh, for their beliefs. Respect and demands for sustainable and responsible practices. Yeah, um, of course, in Islam, yeah, the principles yeah um, that we hold on to. Yeah, we do not waste. We help the communities and we respect each other. Um, one of the hotels in um, uh, Malaysia, yeah, uh, which actually aggressively looking into sustainability. Yeah, the SDG programs are actually the Sunway Group. Yeah, they actually uh, compose yeah the waste. Yeah. Um, some of the food yeah, uh, that they have that can still be eaten, they actually distribute it to the homeless. Yeah? They actually grow their own vegetables. Yeah? So these are some of the elements we actually include yeah, um, in our Muslim-friendly tourism and hospitality requirements, um, as well as um, the um, hospitality services yeah, from the Islamic perspective, how you greet your guests. Yeah? Um, perhaps uh, most of you, uh, it's a normal practice, yeah, where when the guest comes to the hotel, we are given a welcome drink. But actually, in Islamic principles, welcome drink is actually one of the um, 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 actions that are actually encouraged yeah, when we have guests to come to our house. Yeah? So when we have guests to come to our house, the first thing we do is that we actually offer drinks. So hotels, when they do actually offer the welcome drinks, it actually uh, similar to the Islamic practices. Yeah? And also under the Islamic principles, there's this uh, concept of uh, Ikram al duyus and also the concepts of um, lost and found. Yeah. So in Islam, yeah, any goods that are left in the hotels, yeah, that are lost, yeah, there are certain certain um, procedures that we need to to follow. Yeah, the goods, yeah, must be at least kept for one year to ensure that, yeah, it is not given to anyone else. So these are actually the Islamic principles that we are embedding. Yeah, um, not just the facilities, but also the principles. Yeah, for those. Um, uh, who would like to get their, their hotels or their uh, tourism product to, to be recognised. And of course, yeah, uh, when we appreciate nature, history, arts, culture and heritage, yeah, understanding and appreciate multiracial uh, communities with no hatred and feeling insecure, assimilation into other heritage and also arts of the Islamic arts. So in uh, ITC itself, yeah, all these components of Islamic tourism we actually put it in our requirements. Yeah? We do have our recognition program, yeah, which I'm going to share with you. And this recognition program are actually taking into consideration all these components yeah, to ensure that the Muslim travellers that come and, and experience yeah, um, uh, staying in, in Malaysia, for example, yeah, they can actually experience the full pledge of Muslim-friendly yeah, tourism and also hospitality. Okay. Just some uh, brief introduction of Islamic Tourism Centre. We are actually an agency under the Ministry of Arts and Culture of Malaysia, MOTAC. Uh, we have been established since 2009. Yeah? And we developed the concept of Islamic tourism as well as Muslim-friendly tourism and hospitality. So we work together with Tourism Malaysia yeah, um, for all the inbound uh, uh, tourists yeah, that come into Malaysia. So our focus would be, you know, we conduct strategic research on Islamic tourism market intelligence and also policy uh, formulation. We also provide human resource capacity development, yeah, especially in tourism and also professional service standards. Yeah. Uh, we also act as an information sharing platform yeah, on MFTH as well as best sustainable tourism practice. And this is where yeah, we, I encourage yeah, for you to work together with ITC so we, that we can have strategic partnership and collaboration yeah, with government bodies yeah, um, and also uh, industry players. Okay. So these are the recognition program yeah, that we have in ITC. We call it MFA, Muslim Friendly Tourism, Hospitality, Assurance and Recognition. So under this MFA, yeah, similar to uh, hotels where you have star rated, one star, two star and so on. And also in Malaysia, we have a budget hotel. We call it one orchid, two orchid and so on. So for MFA, we have three ratings, yeah, which is silver, gold and platinum. Yeah? The, the lowest would be silver and the highest would be platinum. But 
Yeah, when we say about platinum, it is moving towards Sharia compliance, but not fully Sharia compliant. Yeah, it's Muslim friendly. And this recognition that we are giving, we already started with uh, tourist uh, accommodation, yeah, and also spa and wellness centre. Inshallah, we will uh, continue for another eight schemes that we have. We have ten schemes altogether for the hotels, for the spa, for the medical facilities, um, for the shopping malls, yeah, rest and relax area, convention centre, uh, amusement park. Um, we also have uh, terminal hubs, yeah, as well as uh, we do have for tourism products, yeah. So these guidelines that we are developing, yeah, based on the Malaysian standard MS twenty six ten, yeah, and the recognition that we are giving not just to Malaysia but we're also opening up, yeah, to uh, other countries, yeah. And um, I think yesterday I went and see a Chinese Muslim Association, yeah. They do actually recognize us uh, a lot of. Uh, hotels and also restaurants yeah, uh, in, in Taiwan. Yeah? So uh, the collaborations that we, we are offering is that because we as, as in ITC, yeah, um, we can't go um, um, to all over the countries to actually get your hotels to be uh, recognized under ITC. So this is where we open to collaborate with the Halal Certification Body yeah, with the tourism board of the countries yeah, to see if you, know, if you are interested to get your tourism products yeah, to be recognized by us based on the standards that we have, based on the guidelines that we have. Yeah? Our guidelines are actually, uh, yes, developed by ITC based on the MS 2610, one of the standards in Malaysia. But um, our panel are actually uh, from um, the Ministry of Tourism itself. Yeah? We do have our panels from the Tourism Board as well as our Board of Directors, which can either come from the Minister of Health as well as uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs. Yeah? Another one that we have is actually a Muslim-friendly tourist guide. Yeah? All tourist guides in Malaysia have to be licensed under MUTEC. Yeah? And those who are interested to actually enhance their competency, yeah, this is where yeah, they can get a batch yeah, of Muslim-friendly tourist guide. And this Muslim-friendly tourist guide in Malaysia, they are the only one yeah, that can actually a guide yeah, uh, or the offer the Muslim friendly packages yeah, to, the, to the Muslim travelers in Malaysia. Right. Okay. Uh, other programs will include our trainings. Yeah. We do have our uh, mosque tourism seminar. This is actually open to the mosque institutions that would like to convert their mosque yeah, into a tourism mosque. This is actually the guide for the mosque guide. Yeah. So each, when, when the mosque in Malaysia, when they are identified as a mosque tourism, they, knew, they need to have a mosque guide. Yeah? So this mosque guide would actually explain yeah, uh, the, the basics of, of is Islamic principles yeah, as well as the Islamic architecture yeah, uh, in the mosque. Yeah? We do have Islamic tourism writers workshop. So this is where, um, this is actually a, a, a unique program of ours. We will call all the writers, the bloggers, yeah, the vloggers, yeah, um, together with us yeah, uh, on a journey yeah, to go to a Muslim-friendly site, yeah, Muslim-friendly destination for them to experience what is Muslim-friendly. And when they, they, are, they go out, they write about their experience, they write about the good things about the Muslim-friendly. Yeah, uh, so this workshop we we have done it uh, twice. Yeah, uh, one in Jandebay in in Malaysia, and and also this is for the uh, marketing workshop. Okay, ITELS and also Seed both are these are actually a knowledge sharing the updates of the trends of the Muslim friendly yeah in Malaysia, and finally, okay, um, we have our World Islamic Tourism Conference last year. Yeah, uh, hopefully, inshallah, we'll have it another one in 2025 in conjunction with Visit Malaysia 2025. Yeah, all the programs that we have are actually catering and, and moving towards yeah, the Visit Malaysia 2025. Yeah, that we want to make sure that in order for Malaysia to, to maintain the positioning, yeah, to be a top destination for the OIC country, the infrastructure of the Muslim friendly has to be there. Yeah. Um, the, this include the capacity development, this include the products that we have and so on. And another interesting uh, event that we're going to have, inshallah, this coming August and also September is what we call the Islamic Tourism Month. Yeah. We have, we're going to organize this Islamic Tourism Month from the uh, 21st of August until the 17th of September. Um, why we have it during this month? One, 
because this is where there's a school holiday, Malaysia school holiday. Yeah, number one. And number two, the second week of, uh, of September, this is where Mihas is. Yeah? This is where we have the Halal CB convention. Yeah? So during this period, we are offering, yeah, we are encouraging all the hotels, we are encouraging all the spa owners, we are encouraging all the travel agents to actually promote their packages, to actually promote their discounts to all the travellers, be it local and also, uh, domestic and also international. Yeah. So those yeah, that, you know, as, as mentioned by, by um, uh, um, our uh, Miss, uh, um, okay. uh, earlier, yeah, uh, that we're going to have our Mihas, yeah, inshallah, this coming September. Yeah. So those yeah, who would like to come and experience yeah, Muslim friendly in Malaysia, yeah, come during this period, then you'll enjoy all the discounts, you'll enjoy all the packages, yeah, which includes not just Muslim friendly, but also uh, the mosque tourism. Others would include uh, the Imam Roundtable Conference. Yeah? We do have our research grants yeah, where we give out grants yeah, to universities yeah, to come out with um, um, trends, yeah, uh, to come out with new studies, yeah, new areas yeah, within the Islamic tourism. And that will be presented yeah, in our journal as well as uh, in our Islamic tourism symposium. Right? Okay, so that would be it on the uh, Muslim-friendly uh, tourism and hospitality for Malaysia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. Excellent presentation. Thank you. So the, we have limited time, so we are only open for one question. Any questions from the floor? No, of course, you're, feel, please feel free to write down your question and hand it to our, right. to our staff later on. Thank you once again. Thank you, Marina. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, next please uh, welcome Mr. Moh Tarif, uh, Senior Manager of Halal De Development Corporation Berhad HDC to give us an introduction on Muslim-friendly environment. Please welcome Mr. Moh Tarif. Okay. Uh, distingu uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, hello everybody, good evening. All right, first of all, thank you, uh, the Master of Ceremony. My name is Dalif. You can call me just Dalif, as in Polistat. I'm from HDC, uh, 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 the same organization with my CEO earlier, so I do not want to elaborate further because my CEO has explained who are we. So today I'm going to share a little bit with regards to Muslim friendly. Uh, so thank you, uh, Madam Marina as well. She has uh, explained to us with regards to Muslim Friendly, what is it all about. So my angle today is uh, maybe I can shift a little bit the perspective. How do I? All right. So let's talk about um, what is it that Muslim needs uh, when it comes to Muslim Friendly Travel. Basically, Muslims can travel anywhere, no problem. So we can, we've been traveling everywhere. So there are only few things that we require. Of course, uh, in Malaysia, if you ever been to Malaysia, Malaysia is Muslim majority uh, country where we have uh, so many facilities for Muslim tourists, for other Muslim tourists. But then let's talk about a Muslim like me traveling to country like China, Taiwan. Korea, Japan, and other non-Muslim countries. So there are basically three things, as I may assume, that the Muslim needs during our travel. Uh, like what uh, Madam Marina has shared earlier, so I can summarize it. There are three things. Number one will be, uh, we need to perform our prayers five times per day. Yeah, basically, we can do it everywhere as long as the places are clean. Although there are no, no specific places yeah, that we can find, for example, in Taiwan. So if we go somewhere south in Taiwan, there are no places. But we can manage ourselves, basically. And then number two is that um, Muslims, we need um, what we call the, the, to, to clean ourselves. This is uh, our daily needs. Uh, uh, basically, we need water. We need water to clean ourselves every day and also 
in order for us to perform our prayers, we need water. So that's why uh, if you see in many of the Muslim-friendly travels, uh, they encourage hotels to provide uh, the, 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 the bidet, the toilet. So basically, we need waters. But somehow, if we are anywhere, for example, the, the hotel that we are staying today, uh, Grand Hyatt, there's no such uh, water bidet at the toilet, but we still can manage. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is that although uh, a Muslim can travel anywhere, but it's just that if Taiwan, for example, want to facilitate the Muslim travelers, that will be very much appreciated. And number three, the last thing that Muslim needs during travel, of course, food. Uh, so we can manage to find our foods. For example, today, uh, we had our breakfast in Grand Hyatt. There's no halal Unfortunately, there's no halal food in Grand Hyatt, as you can see. But somehow we know how to manage to find our food. But it will be very much appreciated, very much appreciated, I say. Not that we need that. For the hotel can provide us halal food. If not halal food, other options such as vegetarians. If there is none, it's okay. We can still find our food that we can eat, no problem. Yeah. Okay, so we are talking about Taiwan specifically and Muslim friendly. Like what Mr. Ben has shared earlier, like I said, we are very much appreciate what Taiwan has done so far uh, by, by having uh, a Muslim ambassador, uh, a celebrity of Malaysia. I think this is the second one. Previously, there, is, uh, there was another one, uh, which is a, very much a public figure in Malaysia. So, to, uh, to say that uh, what Muslim needs, here I have summarized a few, uh, summarized few things. Uh, number one is permissible food. If we can have, that will be great. If not, then we, we will try to find on our own. And then, like I said, praying area, if there are, uh, if there are praying areas uh, in anywhere that we travel, it will be very much appreciated. If there is none, we can find you know somewhere at the nook, at the corner of a space, as long as it's clean, we know how to manage. Uh, basically, you, uh, during our travel, usually we'll bring our kit, yeah, like um, a water bottle, a sprayer, we'll bring that because we need water, we need to clean ourselves, like there are some things that we need to do. And also we'll bring a mat. Uh, so it's uh, this is what we always bring. So we can like, you know, we have to perform our prayer on the floor. So we need, you know, the place to be clean and then we'll lay out the mat and we'll do our thing there. So if let's say Taiwan can provide, you know, at the airport like a Muslim travel kit, that would be very much appreciated. If there is none, it's okay. Usually the Muslim already have bring their own stuff uh, in to the countries that has uh, very limited Muslim uh, facilities. All right, so uh, among other things, there are like things that uh, Muslim, the basic needs that Muslim look for are the cleanliness of the spaces, of the places that they go, and also the Qibla direction. In order for us to perform our prayer, we cannot simply randomly face anywhere. But now, thanks to the technologies nowadays, we can simply use our uh, mobile phone to find uh, our Qibla direction, the direction that we need to perform our pray uh, prayer. But if, let's say, there is a place provided in, for example, this building, it will be very much appreciated, like I said. And then uh, bidet, yeah, like I said, we need to clean ourselves. And prayer mat, if you provide them as well. And of course, Muslim does not consume alcohol. Uh, so it's okay. We can distance ourselves from alcohol. But if a restaurant also provides a space, uh, that is separated from the uh, serving of the alcohol, it will be very much appreciated again. Okay? And also, lastly, the prayer timetable. Uh, this is very important for Muslims. So how we manage on our day-to-day -day basis if we are not in our home country is that we always make sure to, to, to know, to, 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 uh, to check our prayer time because it's different. So, uh, so in Taiwan, it has its own prayer time. It depends on the, uh, the direction of the, the position of the sun itself. Uh, so normally, thanks to technologies again, we can find it uh, on, the, on, on our smartphones, no problem. 
Uh, but if the government of Taiwan or uh, there is an um, information counter or there's display or information at the airport to say, that, hey, download this app where you can find the, 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 the direction of your prayer and also the timetable of the prayer, that would be great. Uh, so that would, that would show the commitment that Taiwan has uh, for the Muslim uh, travelers and also welcoming and inviting the Muslims to the country. Okay. All right, next, uh, these are some of the suggested facilities when it comes to the Muslim traveling, Muslims on travel. Number one, food and beverages. Of course, we understand for a country such as Taiwan, there are definitely limitations to provide halal foods. Of course, definitely. Number one, the limitations is the most important one is the understanding of halal food. Yeah? Uh, so we understand that. Yeah, not necessarily that Muslim, you know, if, if someone like me travel to Taiwan, I, I need to find, you know, halal certified food. We understand the limitation. Yeah, and we also can manage with the limitation. Yeah, we will stay away, we will abstain ourselves from the things that we cannot eat and we will find things that we can eat. Yeah, but if you facilitate them, that will be great. So hence, there is such a word of Muslim friendly. Yeah, we understand that it's, very, it's quite difficult, not very, quite difficult for a restaurant in Taiwan to obtain halal certification because there are many things that need to be considered. But this is the idea of Muslim friendly. Huh? Okay, we're going to talk about it a little bit later. And then, like what uh, ITC shared earlier, the tour packages, it would be great also uh, if... Taiwan could have uh, tour packages. I've seen uh, just see, uh, seen just now Ben uh, uh, from uh, Salam Taiwan has said that is very much uh, uh, appreciated and it's awesome I can say. And also public washroom. This is uh, these are the things that we need. And lastly, recreational and wellness facilities. Yeah? So here are some of the things. Yeah? Well, I think this has been discussed earlier, and I think uh, it's not so much of a problem in Taiwan nowadays because the government itself uh, has already aware of what are the things, you know, that they can uh, facilitate for the Muslim with. All right, so let's talk about how HDC can assist with regards uh, to um, Taiwan's intention uh, to grow bigger with Muslim friendly. So uh, what we can do uh, at HDC is, of course, at HDC we do not, we are not certification bodies. We do not give certificates to anybody, but we can assist to help you frame, help you develop your framework uh, when it comes to uh, halal and whatever related to it, such as Muslim friendly, to facilitate your intention. Uh, so basically, uh, this is the rough idea, just to give you some idea on how HDC can assist. Uh, uh, as you can see, uh, look at the far end of the symbols. Uh, these are the main items uh, that what, uh, what travelers will look for, uh, uh, such as hotels, definitely, yeah? and then as well restaurants and also other, other recreational activities such as, uh, um, uh, what do you call that, uh, cruise ship. Uh? So there are plenty of certification bodies. Uh? all over the world, and including Taiwan. Taiwan has several certification bodies, halal certification bodies, and also there are Muslim associations in Taiwan as well. There are, uh, there are few that have been working with HDC, yeah? and only one, I can say at the moment, if I'm not mistaken, that has been recognized by Malaysia. But that's not a problem. Uh, but that one is just for Malaysia. So we are talking about Taiwan. What is it that we can do? There are going back to certification there are so many kinds of halal certification by using different standards and different benchmarks and different guidelines so at hdc what we can assess taiwan is that we can streamline the definition of muslim friendly according to what is it that the country wants uh, so we can streamline it uh, so 
it can be Taiwan can have three, four, five certification bodies. Yeah, but as long as you know they are working together and uh, providing the same meaning to what Muslim friendly is. Uh, so this is the idea that we uh, HDC can assess. So you can have numbers of certification bodies, and in order for you to develop or to streamline the certification bodies, we can help you. How? Is that we have at HDC produces the conformity guidelines for Muslim-friendly hospitality services. Uh, so H HDC in 2020, we have developed a guideline, not for Malaysia. It is because that Malaysia, we have our own uh, standards when it comes to Muslim-friendly. But then we are also receiving a lot of inquiries and also halal has been assisting the muslim friendly travels all this while so rather than uh, having everything scattered all around so what we were just trying to do is that we would like to streamline all of the muslim uh, muslim friendly definitions yeah? so we have come up with the guideline itself yeah so anybody uh, are open this is open for everybody to conform with. Uh, so because there are certification body that says, hey, Muslim travel means this, Muslim travel means that. Uh, uh, so at HDC, we have no problem. We are telling everybody there's no problem. So we are just wanted to pull everyone together. And then we have come up with the benchmark of Muslim friendly. And there are 12 areas of Muslim friendly uh, benchmarks that we have created. Yeah. So number one, of course, accommodation such as resorts and uh, hotels. And uh, number two, FMB, definitely, that is automatic. And number three, transportation hub. Yeah. And then we have leisure transport such as cruises or tour buses. My apology. And then we also have uh, the benchmark for shops or convenience stores, yeah, such as 7-Eleven, if they want to call themselves as Muslim friendly. So what does it take for them to be? What are the things that they need to have in order for them to be called Muslim friendly? Yeah? And then tour packages, of course, this is what we uh, replicate for, from uh, Malaysia standards. Yeah? And then commercial complex, such as shopping malls. So the shopping malls, they want to commercial themselves as, A, hey, we are inviting Muslims to our shopping malls. So we have all the things that Muslim needs. So in order for the shopping complex to do that, what are the things that they need to have? So HDC, we can assist with that. We do have the benchmark for us. And also healthcare. Healthcare is a tourism by itself, even for Malaysia. So what do you call a Muslim-friendly healthcare? Uh, so uh, according to our guidelines, there are several things uh, that need to be complied to. And then as well, we have beauty and wellness, uh, and then recreational facilities such as theme park, gym, what are the things that they need to have in order for them to call themselves as Muslim friendly. And lastly, the tourist uh, attraction, like the heritage site and the museums. These are also the things that we replicated from what we have in Malaysia. But we do understand, like I said, like Taiwan, you have limitations when it comes to providing facilities for Muslim. But you know, to what extent that you can facilitate the Muslim in your country? All right. So how we can assist the Taiwan industry players? I'm giving you one example. Uh, so other than other than our guidelines, we are also we can also assist Taiwan industry player number one uh, to help the certification bodies in Taiwan to equip themselves with the benchmarkings or the guidelines. And number two, we can also directly assess the industry player to, to comply with the certification body requirement. Now, this is just a concept, uh, just the concept, an idea that we can assist Taiwan with. So for example, uh, we can start here. Uh, so we can help the industrial players such as restaurant or convenience store to understand because number one, uh, in order for someone to, to call themselves as halal or Muslim friendly, they need to understand first what are the requirements. If there is no understanding, I'm sorry, uh, it will be 
very difficult uh, to provide uh, the, the, the service to facilitate the Muslims. So at HDC, we can, pro uh, we can provide the understanding of what Muslim needs. Uh, and then also, uh, once they have understood what are the requirements at HDC as well, we can create a program. Yeah, for example, like 10, 100 uh, restaurants in Taiwan that wants to obtain Muslim friendly, we can create a program first training and then we can visit one by one and then we can fix each one of the restaurants, each one of these 100 restaurants to comply with the requirements of Muslim friendly. And lastly, it will be certified halal by the local uh, Muslim friendly certification bodies because Malaysia we cannot certify Muslim friendly or halal uh, uh, particularly in other countries yeah, for the the the, 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 loc the local market so this is the area just to give some idea on how we can assist Taiwan and then this is an example uh, uh, just an example to give you idea uh, with regards to the Muslim friendly certification, not that HDC will pr uh, provide the certification or the labeling, but the, 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 the certification bodies in Taiwan may do this. Uh, so we can help the certification bodies to develop their framework. Uh, this one example, uh, a restaurant in uh, 101. Huh? All right, other than, I'm sorry, we uh, I'm sorry about the, the, the misplacement of the, the wordings over there. And number two, how can we assist Taiwan industry players is that, of course, like I said, the three things earlier, last thing are the food. Huh? So what you can do in Taiwan, what you can facilitate for Muslim travelers is that to make available for ready-to-eat products, ready-to-eat food. Huh? Uh, so maybe a Muslim like me, I cannot enter Din Tai Fung, for example. Yeah, because they serve uh, pork dim sum. Yeah, but then, you know, I still need to eat. Yeah? So I can go to the convenience store and find uh, halal food. And how can you pull all this halal food? Is that through our platform yeah, at HDC, like what my CEO has shared earlier, it's called HIP. So HIP, it's a data pool of halal products readily available. So it can assist uh, industry players, convenience store, uh, in Taiwan to source the halal food. Either in Malaysia, they can source halal food from Malaysia to bring into Taiwan or any other countries. Because in our platform, the HIP platform, uh, we have uh, definitely Malaysia halal products and as well from other countries. So this is what we are trying to do. We want, uh, we, we centralize all of the halal product all over the world. So it can assist uh, industry in Taiwan, for example, to bring the halal product into the convenience store. Uh, so these are the things that, uh, to give you some ideas uh, on how can you facilitate the Muslim travels or the Muslim friendly travels. Uh? So a little bit on the HIP itself. So HIP is much more than that. So I know that, you know, I started to introduce you what HIP is that, you know, uh, to help your industry, player to, uh, industry players to source the halal products, ready to eat food for the Muslim market. But also halal is not just for Muslims. Uh, halal is for everybody. Yeah? Uh, it's, it's the matter of cleanliness, not so much of any ritual to be performed in order, you know, for us to produce the food. Uh? So there are plenty of uh, food there and also HIP, like I said, it's not just uh, the, the marketplace, it's also where buyers and distributors meet. Uh, it's the platform. Uh, and then also, you can find service providers. For example, you want to bring halal products into Taiwan, but then you are concerned yeah, about the quality of the product, the transportation that it brings, yeah, that, 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 that brings the product into Taiwan. So there are also service providers in there, such as Halal Logistics yeah, and other providers as well, or even uh, the, the other software providers as well. And also, there are government agencies and NGO in there. If you need, if any of the uh, industry players in, in, in Taiwan would need to connect with anyone, there are government agencies and NGO 
that, uh, that, that participated in our Halal Integrated Platform. And then there are for Malaysia at the moment only, uh, at HIP, there are venture capital and investors. Uh, there are banks who, who participate uh, in the HIP. So anybody who participate, uh, business player who participate in the HIP will also have the access to uh, to obtain, to apply for special grants or special loans from the banks. Uh, uh, I, I think they have opened it. Some banks are opening to uh, other countries. Taiwan, not yet. Yeah, but there are countries, there, uh, there, there are banks who, who try to open up more and more territories where they can provide the financial assistance. Yeah? And then, of course, in there, there are halal professionals and halal talents. Yeah? For any industry players in Taiwan who already want to move into an advanced stage when it comes to halal, of course, in order for you to be certified halal or to... to, to, to to certify Muslim friendly with your restaurant, you need to have the people who knows about it to work with you, yeah, to be one of your operators. So, uh, in this platform as well, there are pool of people that, uh, that 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 you can source from, yeah, such as uh, it's it's kind of a little bit like LinkedIn where you can find people that have the credential with halal, yeah. And lastly, uh, there is a uh, manufacturers and sellers in the HIP. So it's more than just sourcing your halal products yeah, uh, for Taiwan through HIP. All right. Uh, lastly, uh, this is how HDC again can facilitate Taiwan Muslim friendly industry. Uh, so first, like I said earlier, we can help Taiwanese, everybody in Taiwan to understand either halal or Muslim friendly uh, in any topics. Yeah? And then as well, through, uh, sorry, through our Halal Training Institute. Yeah? And then we can assist industry players in Taiwan. Not just industri industry players. We can also, we are actually assisting other countries as well. The government of other countries to come up with uh, frameworks. Yeah? So we can assist everybody, industry players, government, NGOs, anybody, through our halal consultancy uh, department. Uh, so let's say that the government is serious. I know that Taiwan particularly, you have a uh, new southbound policy uh, that is very much active at the moment. And I have read through everything. Yeah, I guess uh, we are sharing the same energy with regards to that. And I guess through this as well, we can facilitate everybody and we can be part of the, uh, the initiatives. Yeah? Uh, so it depends on the initiative. So maybe Malaysia through HDC, we can uh, assist uh, with regards to developing the framework or the implementation uh, of any areas when it comes to halal or Muslim friendly. And then uh, at HDC as well, we do have uh, halal parks. Uh, uh, this one is uh, mainly for the industrial zone. We can also assist Taiwan if you have the intention to, to, to have a specific um, industrial zone for halal industry players. And uh, like I said earlier, the, our halal integrated platform. And we have several other items. And this, the last thing I would like to highlight is our events as well, uh, like ITC, HDC also, we do have events. Uh, uh, we, we have our own uh, a branded event is called uh, World Halal Business Conference. Uh, it is uh, being done annually for many, many years already. Uh, and it has branched out from Malaysia. And next year, we are, this year, we are going to London in uh, October. Yeah? So this is where uh, all of the... It's not limited to halal players only. It's for everybody who can, who wants to put themselves, to make a presence in halal space. Uh, so this is the conference yeah, that we pull everybody together to discuss, to give ideas and, and to see, uh, to, to view 
uh, in different directions uh, and the possibilities where we can go. So you are all invited to our conference. Uh. So I guess uh, this this is all about my uh, uh, my presentation today. So if you have any questions, so you can either uh, ask me directly or later on. So I'll pass uh, this microphone back to our master of ceremony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dali. Thank you. We do have a question for you, so please oh. remain on stage. So we have a, a participant who is uh, from the textile industry. I'm not sure whether this is uh, related to halal, but uh, the question is how to assist Taiwan's textile industry into Muslim fashion and sports clothes, for example, Muslim fashion or outdoor sports clothes, how to be Muslim friendly and uh, assist Taiwanese textile into this area. All right. Thank you for that question. Interesting. So. Uh, uh, textile industry, so one, Muslims have no problem with the fabric, the material of the fabric. No problem, as long as it is made out of uh, minerals such as, you know, uh, the, the nylon or from the cotton itself. No problem, they are all, we can use them. So I guess when it comes to uh, the, the textile industry to be present in the halal space or the Muslim space is through the clothing itself. Uh, so the, 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 the product itself, how do you appeal to the Muslim? Uh, but when it comes to the material, no problem. But then how you shape it into clothes, this is where you can enter. The modest fashion industry. Uh, not necessarily it has to be full cover or whatever, but it is a mo modest fashion industry. Through this, you can enter the Muslim market. Uh, so uh, I, I summarize a bit. Uh, just... A modest fashion, I think uh, you can, um, you, as you can see, our ladies, Muslim ladies here, this is how we wear. Uh, but then it's, it's not necessarily to be looking like, uh, as, as, as you know, in the Arab culture. It can be colorful, no problem, uh, as long as, you know, uh, the way how you market it. Yeah? Uh, I, I'm not sure whether you have Uniqlo here in Taiwan, but uh, we have Uniqlo in, uh, in, in Malaysia that also uh, provide the marketing towards the Muslim ladies. Yeah? They, they, they sell the same shirt, but the way how they portray their marketing is that you know, they, they combine the material together and then uh, you know, they, they make it looking like you know, uh, expressive. Yeah, towards the Muslim market, towards the modest fashion, how to dress modestly while you can use our brand Uniqlo to dress uh, modestly. So this is where I think textile industry can tap onto the Muslim market through expressing it. Yeah, that it can be worn, it can be styled according to what the Muslim lady needs. Thank you very much for your answer. Okay, we have a gentleman there. Uh, can we uh, oh, just hand the microphone? Yeah. I know the after pandemic, uh, a lot of Malaysia they will prefer outdoor or go to sport. If the Muslim they go to the indoor sport, how they wear, or swimming pool, how they dress. And uh, let the hachia also uh, now have a smart and modern process. And if you keep using the traditional way, how you can uh, let the Muslim go to the fashion industry? Yes, that's my question. Thank you, thank you very much. I guess to answer that, I can make it, uh, I can put it simply. Muslim has our, uh, every Muslim, we have our own dress code. Uh, it's different between men and ladies. Uh, as for men, it's uh, much more lenient, where we can dress whatever, as long as it is loose, uh, it's not too tight. Yeah, but depend, there are some Muslims as well wear tight. Yeah? Uh, but, you know, it is encouraged for us to wear something loose. And what is it that we need to wear is that you know, we need to cover our tops, uh, not necessarily from, from our stomach here until our, uh, until our knees. That's it, for men. Yeah? That's our limit. Uh, we can open ourselves. But the only thing that we need to cover is from our stomach until our knees. But as for ladies, though, uh, it's different. 
Uh, as you can see, our, uh, uh, our guests here, uh, they are the, the exemplary, the example of how um, Muslim ladies need to wear. Uh? Um, number one, of course, it needs to be loose. Uh? And then they need to cover from top to bottom. Uh? And you know, the only thing that they can show is the face and the hands. Uh, these are the, the, the dress code, if you're talking about the Muslim dress code. But they are also in Malaysia. Uh, this is a bit tricky to answer, uh, a bit tricky. Uh, people, even people in Malaysia are also confused. Uh, so there are Muslim dress code that is required by the religion. And there's also the modest dress code uh, that is required by the society in Malaysia. The society in Malaysia, which is very not really talked about, the, the dress code that the, 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 the society accepts is that for the ladies, they need to cover from the chest until the, the elbow. Uh, so it depends on the ladies, what is it that they want to wear. Uh, but when it comes to what the ladies need to wear, uh, according to the religion, is like our ladies here. But then there are also Muslim ladies who prefer to dress according to the society limits. Uh, so basically, what you can facilitate is that when it comes to places that, 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 that require uh, some dress codes, uh, so the Muslim will require the modest uh, dress codes. Yeah? If it's required, for example, uh, onsen in Japan, that everybody has to take off their shirts and be like in their own true form, uh, so there will be a challenge. So typically, uh, the Muslims will stay away from places like this uh, to, to expose themselves. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. We have, uh, that was the uh, question regarding the uh, fashion industry. And we also have one question about the cosmetic industry. Okay. Uh, the question is that uh, cosmetic products or skincare products, if they contain alcohol, can yeah. these products enter the halal or uh, halal market? Or, yes, definitely. Oh, okay, so yeah. is there any like a range um, of alcohol uh, percentage that is yeah. allowed to put into the products? Is there any rules like that? Okay, so speaking of alcohol, not all alcohol are, uh, are, are, are not allowed for Muslim. The only alcohol that is not allowed, actually it's not alcohol that is non-permissible to Muslim. It's the liquor, the things that makes you intoxicated, wine, rum, and all of these beverages that, uh, that can intoxicate you, beer. These are the things that are haram to Muslims. Yeah? But when it comes to alcohol, the element itself, it's not, uh, it's not, uh, uh, not permissible. Mm -hmm. It's allowable. Yeah? So there are, to, to make it simpler, there are um, food alcohol where you produce the food and then the alcohol is created together. For example, um, any fermented items or wine or any drink that is you know, uh, to be consumed. But there are also industrial alcohol for example, your hand sanitizers and most of, you know, that, that you can find in a cosmetics products. Yeah? Because, you know, you need to have this alcohol. One to sanitize and the other one is to preserve the items in that particular concoction. Uh, so, industrial alcohol is not the same with consumption alcohol. So, the only non-halal is consumption alcohol. Whereas when it comes to industrial alcohol, which is it is being produced for the purpose of industry, such as cosmetic, not to be consumed, uh, to make you intoxicated, it is allowable, no problem. Yeah. You can, a Muslim can apply it on our skin. Uh, I don't think there is such limit when it comes to halal, but there is a limit when it comes to uh, the Ministry of Health. Yeah, but when it comes to halal, not so much. Alcohol, no problem. But the problem when it comes to cosmetic is that the ingredient, if it comes from animal derivatives, uh, this is the problem. But if it comes from minerals, naturals, plant, alcohol, and whatnot, I don't think this is such a problem. Okay, thank you. Due to the interest of time, we have to end the Q&A session here. If you have more questions, you're more than welcome to write down your question, hand it to our staff, and we'll get back to you afterwards. Once again, please give a big hand to Mr. Dalif. Thank you very much. 
So, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to um, proceed into the the third session. And uh, so, before we enter the third session, a few uh, a few household reminders. Uh, the presentations in today's forum will be provided by answering the questionnaire at the end of the event. So. Um, 如果我们等今天的这个投影片，那请在这个是这个今天活动结束之后，大家填写问卷，然后呢留下您的 email 就可以，就是呃我们就会把这个呃投影片就是提供给您哈。OK， now um the third session in this session will focus on the topic of strengthening the halal industry, Taiwan and Malaysia supply chain collaboration, and um. So our first speaker of the session is Ms. Aninawati Saleh, Director of Malaysian Friend, uh, Friendship and Trade Center, Taipei. Please welcome her. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a bit challenging for me to talk at this hour, and I've been informed outside it's raining, so just be bear with me with uh, and, and stay in this room. Maybe when you go out, the rain will stop and then you can go back, okay? Okay, my name is Anina. Uh, I'm from uh, Matrade, Taipei, under the trade section of Malaysian Friendship uh, and Trade Center. So I'll be talking about the halal industry and how we can collaborate on the supply chain uh, collaboration. So this would be uh, the contents of my uh, presentation today. I will talk a little bit on the trade, uh, bilateral trade snapshot, the halal in global perspective, um, strengthening on the supply chain, what uh, are our engagement in halal with Taiwan and what we can offer. So this would be the overall of our trade performance, Malaysia's trade performance in 2022. So we have uh, surpassed a good um, record, surpassing 2 trillion ringgit for the second consecutive year. And uh, the trade grew with double-digit expansion of 27.8%. And our exports also rose. And you can see um, in the chart the, our relationship with Taiwan. So Taiwan would be the third, uh, actually the largest source country after uh, China and also ASEAN in 2022. And in terms of market, we also uh, manage with uh, exports to major trading partners like ASEAN, China, US, European, uh, EU, and uh, similarly exports to FTA partners also um, uh, recorded highest uh, uh, double digit growth and to some of the um, RCEP partner agreement that we have uh, also last year. So uh, the top 10 exports destinations, um, Taiwan is our uh, top 10, within the top 10, number 9th. And these markets actually accounted for 87.7% of Malaysia's uh, total exports. And the performance of key markets, some of the key markets, um, in Malaysia's perspective, meaning to say our uh, stats, shows that uh, Taiwan was our fifth largest trading partner behind China, Singapore, US and Japan, accounting for 5.5% of Malaysia's total global trade in 2022, the 11th uh, largest export destination and third largest source of import behind China and Singapore. This would be some of the uh, main components that we import and we export with Taiwan. Um, more than 60% actually in the ENE products component basically um, consists of the semiconductors. Uh, we export optical and scientific equipment, petroleum products, manufacturers of metal and machinery equipment. And some of the products are also uh, being imported back to our country to value add it and also to export it back to other countries. So uh, this is actually derived from a source that we have from the IHS market. Uh, the new southbound policy, um, the countries that actually Taiwan um, has actually, uh, in total is 18 countries. So these are the top 10 countries that have the most um, active trade flows uh, into Taiwan, which is, um, you can see Malaysia ranked number two, 
from Malaysia into Taiwan and also uh, what Taiwan actually export to Malaysia. So we can see our trade relationship, uh, uh, both uh, Taiwan and Malaysia is quite strong. So looking at the halal global perspective, I'm giving you some of the um, biggest pictures on what we have in globally for the um, halal perspective, which some of the earlier speakers also have been shared. So um, look, look at how Malaysia actually be uh, ranked in, the, in terms of Islamic finance, halal food, the Muslim-friendly travel, um, modest fashion, pharmaceutical and cosmetics, and the media and recreation. And um, we also rank number one in terms of the top 15 countries um, under the uh, Global Islamic Economy Indicator. And this would be some of the global perspective in terms of the opportunities. Uh, and there are still um, figures that can be uh, um, you know, tapped into the... Uh, and uh, we are looking at how we can collaborate with Taiwan in terms of um, uh, the areas that we've mentioned in just now. So let's look into the uh, supply chain factors. Uh, this is actually the stats that we have uh, based on the Malaysian companies that registered um, uh, with halal certification that exports to global in 2022. So um, the biggest chunk, it is under the FMB, comprised of 5.93 billion, halal ingredients, 4.98 billion uh, US dollar. Uh, we have cosmetics, palm oil, derivative, uh, industrial chemicals, and pharmaceutical uh, products. So the top halal export destination that we export to, uh, China, uh, Singapore, Japan, US, and Indonesia. And uh, what we want to emphasize is that uh, in Malaysia, we have uh, more than 7,200 certified companies in the halal industry which more than 1,800 halal registered companies are actually exporting globally. So if we are looking at these uh, figures, there are room for uh, Taiwan companies to collaborate with Malaysian in terms of um, uh, um, the raw ingredients or the finished products and, and maybe the, the, in terms of the, un, uh, the, the advanced technology that Taiwan have to actually value add back to Malaysian uh, companies for them to uh, export back to other countries. So uh, uh, this is our exports to Taiwan uh, since 2013 uh, for the past 10 years. So you can see um, why I extract these uh, sectors is because this can be seen um, a very straightforward that maybe there is an element of halal in there because uh, it's actually palm oil, seafood, other vegetable oil, processed food. Uh, maybe less than 10% is not halal because most of our companies uh, and, and manufacturing plant is actually halal certified. So you can see the growth, a very significant growth in the sector of uh, palm oil and palm oil-based products actually increased from 2013 to 2022, jump more 122% uh, growth. Seafood is 200% growth and processed food, 108% growth. So these are the areas that we are looking at, at how in the supply chain area, how Malaysia and Taiwan is actually collaborating in terms, in terms of the ingredient-wise. Indirectly, it, it is also um, halal ingredients in, into Taiwan. But of course, uh, we are aiming not only to uh, look at the traditional FMB ingredients, we are also looking at uh, plant-based products, organic food, uh, and also functional food. And the non-food sectors as well, uh, like uh, medical devices, uh, biopharmaceuticals, um, and also looking at the services industry, there's a lot of um, a room to be improved and to collaborate in the medical tourism. Uh, especially like nursing home and wellness fa facilities and also modest fashion. Because we know Taiwan, um, is a, their, their medical part is very advanced on the, on the, on the hospitalization and also on the treatment-wise. So maybe 
uh, there's a room for collaboration in terms of the um, on on providing um, Muslim friendly kind of uh, facilities or treatment while the elder people have the treatment in Taiwan. Okay, this is the, the information that I extract from TIDA, uh, which is the same uh, shared by Miss Rachel just now. Um, I just want to highlight that um, as of March 2023, um, TIDA has uh, endorsed more than 700 uh, certificate, halal certificates and look at the tremendous uh, area of certificates that they actually certified under the uh, healthy food, under the uh, um, uh, like uh, you know additive uh, food material, which is um, basically I also had a chance to meet with one of the Taiwanese um, uh, large company, which have more than two hundred uh, halal certificates, which said to me that they also um, export their uh, materials to Malaysia and Indonesia. So um, this kind of collaboration would also give an advantage to the Malaysian side because on the advance of Taiwan has in terms of innovation and the technology-wise, it can also improve back to Malaysia to value add into their products to, to make it a more quality products to enhance it and then they can export back to other uh, countries. So this is the um, just to highlight the ecosystem that we have. Um, it's very much established, and we are also moving to the um, uh, HIMP, the Halal Integrated uh, Plan for 2030. Uh, so um, and looking at the element of what, um, in terms of the, the 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 standards that we have, the the agencies that we have, we are looking at to further enhance our Malaysia um, capability and, and potentials in the halal ecosystem. And this is some of the halal park that we have. And um, if we are looking at investment into Malaysia, uh, Taiwan may also look at uh, to collaborate with Malaysia in terms of investing in the halal, uh, uh, halal industry park to write on the um, establishment of what Malaysia has in terms of the ecosystem, the knowledge that we have, the the end-to-end the -end kind of uh, first, um, uh, services that we have in terms of halal. And together with Malaysia, uh, they can grow the company and also to, to embark to other uh, potential country and other Muslim countries in terms of uh, expansion of them abroad out of Taiwan. So these are some of the engagement that we have with uh, Taiwan. Um, last year in Mihas, uh, we bring uh, Malaysia, uh, we bring the Taiwanese buyers uh, to visit our Mihas under the International Sourcing uh, Buyer Program, and uh, we also um, have one. Uh, uh, last year, because it's a bit special, there's also physical and also uh, in hybrid mode. So we managed to bring one uh, Taiwanese buyer for the physical. And, we, and for this year, we managed to secure uh, nine Taiwanese buyers, including one premium buyer to visit Mihas for the buyer sourcing program. And uh, so we would like to reach out to new buyers as well. Uh, if you have interest uh, um, you know, to expand and to source from Malaysia in terms of ingredients and, and finished products of halal, please come uh, and contact us and we can share you more about my, uh, Mihas. Uh, this is also one of the programs that we have last year. It's the Halal uh, Medical Industry. And this year, we had uh, also promote uh, and support the food uh, Taipei uh, in that happening in June. So this is the event that I'm talking about just now, Mihas. Uh, it's a in Malaysia International Halal Showcase where it has uh, the, the both uh, element of food and non-food category. Um, please visit if you have the chance to. It's happening in, in September this year. And uh, in, we don't only have the exhibition part. We also have uh, the... Uh, the um, the, the element of sharing of information 
under the uh, the conferences uh, and forum, and also we bring buyers from all around the world to visit Mihas to exchange uh, during the business matching. And these are some of the milestone of Mihas that we had since the beginning of the um, establishment. And the achievement that we have last year, as I said just now, uh, for the buyer program, we for this year actually we managed to uh, to secure a total of two hundred and ninety nine foreign buyers from all around the world, including some of the non favorite uh, countries like Bhutan, Mauritius, Nigeria, Kenya, Tanzania, Kosovo, Russia, and Colombia, and we are targeting a sales target of two point one billion ringgit. And uh, as of now, 90% of the booth are all sold out and we are expecting to be occupied uh, fully in August. Uh, but for um, companies who have interest, uh, we still accept the virtual uh, element of the business matching. You can come and contact us and we can help to organize that. Uh, it will be happening until 15th of November this year. So this is, uh, I will share about basic information on Matrid. Uh, we are the uh, trade promotion agency under the uh, Ministry of Investment, Trade and Industry, METI. And we are looking after to export promotion um, on the Malaysian product and services globally. Um, our role is actually similar to TITRA, uh, but it's just an opposite uh, because we are looking at Malaysia to promote um, outside of uh, to globally. So we have also um, trade offices around the world. And some of the element of what we do, we facilitate on the uh, development side. We gave some um, training to our SMEs the, uh, on the capacity building. We provide trade and market information and trade advisory services. And all our uh, services are free. And this is our information of the office. If you have any question or anything that you wish to source from Malaysia to inquire, please contact us. Uh, and, uh, and again, we don't charge. Okay, uh, so last but not least, um, please contact us if you have any uh, sourcing interest from Malaysia. And I think that's all for now. Thank you. Sisi. Thank you. Please give a big hand to Ms. Aninawati. So please remain on stage. When do we see uh, uh, if there is any, anyone on the floor? From the floor? Okay, we have questions coming in. Okay, we have several. I have a launch of questions coming in. Okay. Okay, the first question we have is that, is it possible for a small business company to find a free halal certification consultant or to attend free halal certification training courses uh, for food in Taiwan? Um, what I know, uh, you can refer to those uh, certification body that mentioned by uh, the earlier speakers, but the one that uh, recognized by Malaysia, by our JAKIM, is TIDA. Uh, Taiwan Halal Industry uh, Integrity Development Board, I, I, uh, yeah, uh, TIDA Association. Yeah. But uh, other than that, I think being mentioned by Mr. Ben just now, there are also um, few other certification body which I believe they do uh, provide uh, the capacity building um, and training related to what is being mentioned just now. Thank you for your answer. And the second question is that um, can um, foreign investors buy lands and properties in Malaysia? Mm, okay. Um, it's not under my territory, but I can try to answer it. Okay. Uh, if you are looking at investment for manufacturing, uh, meaning to say you want to have an investment and to have your own uh, factory to produce product. So there are, uh, you can own uh, a land, but it also depends on which area that you have the investment. There will be a state, each state has their 
uh, own regulation that you can refer to. But uh, you can also refer to our sister agency, MIDA, Malaysia Investment Development Authority. We can share that contact to you later. Uh, they might have, uh, they can actually guide you in terms of your um, interest towards investing. But uh, in, they are looking also some uh, of the capping of the investment value. And, and if you are looking at a certain incentive uh, in terms of value and also in terms of the segments or sectors that you are investing in. There are some uh, sectors that actually we are promoting under the uh, investment into Malaysia. Thank you, Ms. Anin Hawati. I know this is probably not that closely related to the topic we're talk talking today, but thank you for answering to that question. And uh, another question is also from the textile industry, right? Like how uh, this, um, how does Taiwan, uh, how to help Taiwan uh, textile industry to gain a strong position? And uh, I will say, I'm, I'm, I'm quite, not quite sure about the first one, and we'll just jump to the second one. Like, um, Taiwan has Textile Industry Research Institute. Uh, do you have such a textile in, uh, research center in Malaysia? And uh, because um, this, um, uh, this gentleman believes that Malaysia can be the halal uh, textile fashion and the fashion leader in the world, and if we, we can find good opportunity to collaborate with the Taiwan's in uh, the textile, textile industry. So the question is, um, do you have uh, such a, like Taiwan, we do have Textile Industry Research Institute. Do you have such a research center in Malaysia? Uh, in terms of specific uh, textile industry, I'm not really sure, but we do have a um, federation of manufacturer, we call it FMM in Malaysia, which, also, which covers all uh, segments of uh, sectors, including textile, in, including FMB, including machineries, and 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 uh, etc. But um, uh, we have a lot of like uh, association or um, designers or uh, uh, association that that are, they are looking at members who looking at a certain certain design or certain certain fashion of of clothing perhaps. Um, but what I can see. Uh, in terms of collaboration, like I said just now, Taiwan, um, your strongest uh, value is that your technology and innovation part. Um, perhaps it can be actually uh, shared with the Malaysian in terms of the uh, machine that you have or maybe the advances that you have um, because Malaysia also we are moving towards the, um, uh, you know, not to rely on labor, but we are moving on the IR 4.0 on the automated kind of uh, facilities to to move our um, capacity and capability of the industry of this of the SMEs companies to grow further. And um, if you are looking at to collaborate in terms of the modest fashion, perhaps the Malaysian can share on the on the guideline part on on the designing part. So that that would be a services to collaborate uh, that can give some guidance to the Taiwanese on what are the areas or what are the Muslim uh, population looking for in terms of the textile industry. Thank you very much, Ms. Aninawati. Please, once again, give a big round of applause to Ms. Aninawati for her excellent talk and thank you for answering the questions. Thank you. Okay, next, may I please invite the next speaker of the session, Mr. Tony Lee, Senior Marketing Planner of uh, Com uh, Commerce Development Research Institute, CDRI, to deliver the final presentation of the day. Please welcome Mr. Lee. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, that's good. Okay, dis distinguished guests and all the speakers for today, and all the audience, uh, if whatever you are, wherever you are on site or online, and good afternoon, or I can say good evening. <laughs> 
Okay, here comes the last speech of today, and I'm the speaker, Tony Lee from CDRI Commerce Development Research Institute. And today, uh, I'm going to talk about how uh, Taiwan and Malaysia to cooperate about uh, on the halal supply chain. And today, uh, for this topic, we will, I would like to uh, solve the problem from the consumer's point of view. As a result, uh, we might, uh, let's move to today's agenda. So for the first part, I, I will try to uh, explain, uh, uh, simply introduce what is Hala, and then to let everybody know how uh, Muslim consumers know about Hala and Hala certification. And secondly, I will introduce, uh, take a quick look at Taiwan's situation. And finally, we will, find, uh, we will propose some uh, proposals for the cooperation. So first of all, what is halal? Halal is an important uh, concept in Islam, derived from the Arabic word, and it refers to things and that are in accordance with Islamic law. So uh, for the halal, and it not only uh, ut and utilize the concept on the food, but also on the beverages and cosmetics, even on the travel and finance. Uh, to sum up, it would be a way of uh, living. But why is halal important? So to con uh, it is uh, it don't it doesn't uh, I don't need to say much about the importance of halal. And because it's a uh, halal is kind of the religious obligation, halal is seen as part of the fulfilling of a religious obligation for Muslims. By following the halal guidelines, Muslim believes that they are fulfilling their duty to Allah and receiving the divine blessings. And also, halal is sacredness and purity. And also, uh, halal food is healthy and ethic because uh, halal food is prepared through the specific methods of slaughter and also the manufacturing process and the ingredients needs to meet the specific standards. So it will be relatively healthier and ethic. And also the last one uh, will be the social cohesion because halal food and dietary practices are integral parts of the Muslim community, contributing to the community cohesion and shared identity. So in conclusion, halal is important for Muslims as it represents a dietary and behavioral way of life in accordance with the requirements of Islamic law. And in, uh, in the past few decades, the concept of the halal certification appears. So halal certification ensures the food and products meet the standards that set by, uh, set by Islamic law. And on the other hand, halal certification also do a huge impact on consumer behaviors. For example, uh, we uh, collect uh, many studies. There have already been many academic studies that shows the halal certification uh, do impacts on the uh, consumer behaviors. Like uh, if given the choice, the majority of Muslims prefer to purchase products and services that have been halal certified. And also as part of their religious obligation, Muslims have a preference for consumer, consuming products that have undergone halal certification. And also the presence of the halal certification logo influenced the purchasing decisions of Muslim consumers. And there is a growing global preference for halal products. And last but not least, uh, uh, apart from the consumer, also the brand owners and the manufacturers uh, seize the opportunity. They think that uh, halal certification will be an opportunity for them and seeks to uh, apply the certification for their products. So how do Malaysian Muslims think about, okay. According to the, our studies uh, in a few years ago uh, by online, we collected um, about uh, 1,000 respondents, uh, Muslim respondents from Malaysia, and know that more than 19% uh, uh, of the respondents think that halal certification are necessary. And meat, processed food, and seasonings, medicines, and supplements is a must. They must need, uh, they must need to get halal certified. 
And also, while the, on the other hand, uh, cosmetics and personal care products will be nice to have one. And to further know the uh, to know more about how piety affects Muslim consumer behavior, we conducted an academic study. <laughs> According to the rational uh, choice theory of religion, we can assume that uh, we can assume that uh, the more piety, uh, uh, the most pious uh, Muslims are, the more important they think of halal certification. We use Muslims' adherence to the prohibitions of Islam to measure piety and see if they are uh, if they think halal certification is important, and we utilize a binary logistic regression to run the data, and we finally found that the assumption is uh, correct, which means that for a pious area, halal certification would uh, halal certification would be much more important. As a result, we would like to recommend that uh, the cooperation of the supply chain can be surrounding around the uh, HALA certification. Maybe, wait a minute. Okay. Okay, so after we knew that the dimensions should be surrounding the, on the HALA certification, let's take a quick look on the Taiwan situation. So in the past few decades, uh, Taiwan has uh, witnessed steady growth and development in halal industry. Here are some uh, key aspects of halal development in Taiwan. First is the increasing uh, Muslim population. Because of the uh, inter internal, international exchange of the students and also the introduction of the foreign laborers, and Taiwan's uh, Muslim population has grown, uh, has keep growing uh, in the past few decades. And then the halal certification is an important part. The halal food and beverage industry in Taiwan has also seen development. Several halal certification bodies offer their services in Taiwan to ensure that the halal food meets the requirements and of the Islamic law. And the availability of the halal food has gradually increased and can be found in the supermarkets, restaurants, and also food stores. And also the promotion of the Muslim culture is uh, well done by the government organization and non-government organization, non organizations. And also, uh, like, uh, Mr., uh, like the previous speaker said, uh, Taiwan have, has, have already uh, developed a well uh, halal tourism. Okay, uh, so let's uh, quickly take a, uh, let's see some data um, for the halal products exported from Taiwan. We can on the left hand, left hand side, we can see uh, for the export area, uh, mostly will be uh, in uh, export to Asia, and most are uh, especially in Malaysia and Indonesia. And for the goods export goods type, and the largest proportion will be the others category. But in this category, uh, which includes the semi products and raw materials for halal products. So it will also be a, a sim important part to be uh, included into the halal supply chain. There is another thing I want to mention about Taiwan is about uh, its logistics. Uh, because we have an efficient transportation network and we have uh, airline, airways, highways, and also seaports, and so that we can provide uh, many diverse, uh, diverse options for the delivery and to deliver the halal products and foods uh, quickly and fr in their freshness and quality. And also, we utilize the cold chain logistic capabilities. Uh, we maintain the freshness and hygiene because it is crucial for the halal food products. Taiwanese logistics providers uh, use the uh, cold chain logistics, offering the temperature control and refrigerated transportation services to ensure the quality and safety of the halal food products during the transportation. And also, we utilize the uh, logistics technology because uh, we use the kind of IoT, Internet of Things, and big data, and also the artificial intelligence, AI, to enhance the logistics efficiency and traceability. Uh, traceability is also an important part in the HALA concept. Okay, these technologies can assist on the uh, HALA industry, uh, 
can help Taiwan to uh, run well, to be a good foundation. Okay, so for the last part will be uh, how to cooperate. After reviewing the overview of the Malaysia and Taiwan, I would like to propose several uh, directions and possibilities for collaboration. Firstly, as I mentioned earlier, a significant part uh, of the collaboration will be around the HALA, HALA certification. So HALA certification uh, emphasizes uh, the compliance of the raw materials, manufacturing processes, and logistics and packaging materials to required standards for a product to be certified as HALA. And then to strengthening the collaboration in the HALA supply chain, uh, they can be approached from three directions, I think. The first one will be the semi-finished products, and the second one will be the packaging materials, and the, sec uh, and the third one will be the logistics. So uh, regarding the semi-finished products and the raw materials, Taiwan has a diverse uh, range of uh, manufacturers, including those in food industry and also in the cosmetics industries. And there are suppliers of raw, mater uh, raw materials and ingredients and also additives. Additionally, uh, Taiwan's biotechnology industry is thriving uh, with many companies specializing in the extraction of the various nutrients which can be utilized as a raw materials for pharmaceuticals and uh, health supplements and also the nutritional products and the functional foods. So integrating these business into the supply chain can effect effectively enhance the development on the HALA supply chain. And the next one will be the packaging. Packaging materials and machineries are Taiwan's strengths. And to meet HALA requirements, uh, packaging must also comply with the spe specified standards. And Taiwan has numerous suppliers of packaging materials, and integrating them into the supply chain would strengthen the industry too. And additionally, uh, the Taiwan Packaging Association consists of many members who are suppliers of packaging materials and also the packaging machineries and making them into the potential partners for bilateral cooperation will be great. And furthermore, Taiwan has a significant capabilities in the research and development. So uh, like cooperating with the universities like uh, Chenggong University or Yangming Jiao Tong University that would uh, help to, uh, or other research institute like Plastic Center, uh, they would uh, have big energy on the research and development. So to develop, uh, to make, or uh, to manufacture, or to uh, design a new material for packaging. And also the last part, like I mentioned before, uh, the direction will be on logistics. Because uh, traceability is a crucial aspect in, of HALA collaboration. So uh, logistics is also important. So in this part, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Taiwan's logistics system is well developed and it can provide valuable experiences and solutions to Malaysia. And also enabling the effective developments of their logistics and cold chain systems. So in this regard, and the Taiwan Association of Logistics Management and Taiwan Coaching Association can play a, an important role in facilitating bilateral cooperation and also the knowledge exchange or, or maybe the Thailand exchange and furthermore cooperations. Additionally, Taiwan has also has uh, some smart logistics suppliers who can provide uh, uh, appropriate uh, solutions to Malaysia, which can enhance uh, or to strengthen the HALA supply chain. Okay, this was uh, this will be the end of my uh, speech. So, in conclusion, through the collaboration in these areas, we can effectively enhance the cooperation between the Taiwan and Malaysia in the HALA supply chain, and fostering the development of the HALA industry. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lee, for your insightful talk.
Now, um, thank you very much for staying with us at this time. So any questions from the floor? Certainly, we can enhance our collaborations and to achieve greater results. Any questions from the floor? If there is no other, yes, oh, we have one here. Okay, Let's see. Okay, and the question is: uh, the products and the production of our uh, of our company in Taiwan are followed by the halal um, regulations. However. Our ingredient suppliers from other countries does not want to apply for the halal certification. So do you have any suggestions for us to deal with this kind of situation and to apply for the halal certification? Thank you. Uh, just to clarify, uh, I would like to know more about your company's situation. Uh, is your ingredient is imported from other countries and who is not uh, comply with the halal standard? Okay, so that is uh, where, okay, please give the microphone to the lady over there. Yes, this is the problem we have right now, and yeah. our ingredients are from Vietnam, yeah. and they don't want to apply for this certification, so uh, we have some difficulties to apply for one. Okay, since I uh, actually I'm not a uh, part of the HALA certification, we I maybe uh, for your problems uh, we can seek for the suggestions from maybe Theta or other kind of the HALA certification bodies in Taiwan because uh, uh, we CDRI did not uh, provide this kind of the services and. Actually, I can help you to uh, help you to uh, uh, forward your questions to the relative agencies and to seek uh, if they have uh, better solutions for your problems. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you. Yes, I was wondering whether our distinguished guest can have some oh, yeah, input, yeah, yeah. yeah, to and suggestions <laughs> for you. That would be nice. Yes. I, I guess we are the option for you. Yes. Come to us. <laughs> we can provide you more halal ingredients okay. that can easily um, you know give you the assurance to get your certification okay, of course <laughs> thank no you. problem thank you thank you miss aninawati any other questions uh let me see we have do we have other questions from here or do we have another question from the floor no but we have a very good question and your question is answered Yes. Perfect. <laughs> so if there is no other question for Mr. Lee, we want to once again thank him for his excellent presentation. Please give a big hand to Mr. Lee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And the forum today is coming to an end. And we want to thank all the speakers uh, for sharing your invaluable insight and all the distinguished guests for your generous participation, including our dear Malaysian friends who are joining us online and on site. So for participants who are joining us um, at the uh, TICC today, please hand your questionnaire to our staff at the entrance and the presentation files will be sent to the email ad address you leave on the questionnaire. So if you're joining us online, um, we will have a QR code for you to scan and you can scan the QR code and uh, answer the questionnaire, and the, you will um, uh, the uh, presentation files will um, send to you. So once again, thank you very much for your generous participation. We wish you a pleasant day. Thank you. 那今天我们非常感谢我们的讲师们精彩的演讲。那么我们在离场之前也请各位填写问卷，然后把问卷交给我们的工作人员。那么简简那个简报会寄到问卷上您所提供的电子呃电邮信箱。那么线上与会的贵宾，请扫描 Q R code 来填写问卷。再次感谢大家的莅临，祝各位有愉快的一天，谢谢。